Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Welcome to today's hearing. Today we begin Module 8 of this phase of the inquiry. Uh, module 8 differs in some respects from the earlier modules, in particular because uh, most of the evidence that we are to hear will be presented by lawyers representing those whose relatives died in the fire. As many of those uh, following the proceedings will know, the coroner for Inner London West has opened inquests into the deaths of those who died in and as a result of the fire. Uh, those inquests have been adjourned pending the conclusion of the inquiry and the publication of its final report. It will be for the coroner to decide in due course what further steps to take in relation to those inquests, but if she is satisfied that the scope and depth of the inquiry's investigations match those which she would have carried out, it will be open to her to adopt its findings, thereby relieving her and the families of the burden of any further proceedings as far as she is concerned. Uh, that being so, I've made it clear on many occasions that the inquiry will do all that it properly can within its terms of reference and in accordance with the procedures appropriate to a public inquiry to ensure that it finds all the facts which the coroner would need to find when conducting an inquest which complies in all respects with uh, all aspects of domestic law, including the requirements of Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the circumstances which give rise to the fire and the events of the night of the 14th of June 2017 have been investigated in Phase 1 of the inquiry and the previous modules of Phase 2. It remains, therefore, only to ensure that sufficiently detailed findings can be made about the individual deceased and the circumstances in which they died. Uh, much of the evidence is already before the inquiry, but it is necessary to gather together the threads in order to enable the full picture to be drawn in each case. It's also necessary to hear evidence from those who were responsible for the removal of the deceased remains from the tower and the identification of the deceased themselves. Those witnesses will be examined by counsel to the inquiry. The evidence, and indeed this module as a whole, is inevitably sensitive and for some will be distressing. The panel has therefore agreed that apart from the witnesses to whom I have just referred, the material which we have to consider should be presented by those who represent the bereaved, who will draw to the attention of the panel the evidence relating to each individual deceased. In order to ensure that the proceedings are conducted in a dignified and respectful manner, there will be significant intervals between the various presentations. Yes, Mr. Millett. Mr. Chairman, members of the panel, uh, as the Chairman has just said, this is the start of the final module of this phase of the inquiry, Module 8. I need to explain a little bit more about the origins of Module 8, what it is and what it is not. In the early stages of this inquiry, the, uh, the RLRs for the bereaved families asked the chairman to conduct an investigation under Article 2 of the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights. After submissions were made in March and September 2018 about the nature and scope of that investigation, he agreed that he would investigate the facts that the coroner, Professor Fiona Wilcox, senior coroner for Inner London West, would be required in law to find in order to discharge her statutory functions under Section 5 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. That task now falls to all of you, the panel. I should explain the background in a little bit more detail. The origins of what has now become Module 8 help to explain and to characterise the nature of the hearings that are about to follow. The broad history in outline is as, is as follows. On the 20th of December 2017, after reading and hearing opening statements from the BSRs, the chairman said that he hoped that the inquiry would be able to achieve an outcome whereby the coroner's statutory obligations to find the facts would be discharged by the inquiry's own work. In doing so, 
he raised two notes of caution. First, that the inquiry can only work within the terms of reference, and second, that the procedure would be that of a public inquiry and not that of an inquest. On the 28th of March 2018, after a procedural hearing on the 21st of March 2018, at which further submissions were made on this topic, the chairman issued a direction in which he said that on the material then available, he saw no significant difficulty in making findings which would be sufficient to meet the requirements of an, an investigation which complies with Article 2 of the ECHR. He noted in particular the difficulty in making extensive and detailed findings about the movements of each deceased on the night, but expressed some hope that he would be able to make sufficient findings of fact without imposing an unreasonable burden on those involved. The offer from some of the families for cooperation and assistance in the preparation of the relevant material was noted. At a further procedural hearing on the 3rd of September 2018, I welcomed the proposal to hold dedicated hearings for the deceased in which the RLRs for the BSRs would tie together the evidence regarding the deceased in a set-piece oral hearing at which the advocates for the families presented the evidence relating to their loved ones after the expert evidence. The hearings were initially anticipated to take place during the Phase 1 report writing period and to be addressed in that report, but in the end that did not prove to be necessary because by then so much material, and crucially the written and oral evidence received from the BSRs, was already in the possession of the inquiry. It could be analysed and presented in the Phase 1 report as it was, in fact, in Part 2, Chapters 10 to 20, Periods 1 to 11, under the subsections, Conditions in the Tower and Movement of Occupants. On the 12th of September 2018, the Chairman indicated that he welcomed the suggestions that representatives for the BSRs should take the lead in marshalling the evidence surrounding the circumstances in which their loved ones died, but reiterated that, that although he, and now you, the, mem the, the panel, would necessarily retain responsibility for the inquiry's findings. Detailed submissions, supported by a written analysis in whatever form, would be most convenient and would likely be likely to be of greatest assistance when it came to drafting that part of the panel's report. He also concluded that it was right that in connection with this particular aspect of the inquiry's work, counsel for each of the bereaved families who lost loved ones in the fire should be able to address the panel on the evidence bearing on the issues relevant to Article 2 of the ECHR, so far as relevant to the individual deceased, rather than leaving that task to me, counsel to the inquiry. Further submissions and correspondence followed during 2019 and into 2020, and since, during which the scope and the nature of this module have been further refined and defined with clarity. I turn to the coronial facts the inquiry's task, thus assumed, is to investigate the facts that the coroner would be required in law to find in order to discharge her function under Section 5 of the 2009 Act, and in doing so, to adopt a procedure which complies which, with Section 17 of the Inquiries Act, namely to act with fairness and to avoid any unnecessary cost, whether to the public funds or witnesses or otherwise. The 2009 Act... Uh, restricts the coroner to answering four questions. Who the deceased was, and how, when, and where the deceased came by his or her death. Where Article 2 of the ECHR is engaged, the question of how the deceased came by his or her death is to be interpreted not only as by what means, but also as in in what circumstances. The panel has decided that the facts to be investigated in this module are, in relation to each deceased, uh, ninefold plus or one further. First, their name, gender and age. Second, the number of the flat in which they lived and the floor number. Third, the background and composition of their household. Fourth, what messages, if any, passed between them and the emergency services or between them and others and what information about them was held by the emergency services. Fifth, whether the firefighters tried to rescue them. Sixth, where they died. Seventh, the time of their death, so far as it can be ascertained. Seventh, the movements between... Out eighth, their movements between out outbreak of the fire and the time of death. 
and ninth, the medical cause of their death, to which we add a tenth fact, namely whether they had any vulnerabilities and whether those were known to the TMO or RBKC. Uh, you, the panel, will make those factual findings on a deceased-by-deceased basis in your Phase 2 report. I turn then to the inquests. The coroner opened 70 inquests on various dates between the 21st of June and the 22nd of November 2017. No inquests were opened, either for Logan Gomez, the stillborn child of Marcio Gomez and Andrea Perestrello, or for Maria del Pilar, Pili Burton, who survived the fire but died in January 2018. The coroner told the police that there would be no inquest for Logan Gomez because he did not have a life independent of his mother and is therefore outside the coroner's jurisdiction. Although outside the coroner's jurisdiction, it does remain possible, however, for you, the panel, to investigate the circumstances of Logan Gomez's death when considering the evidence relating to the other deceased's. We have, or you have, received some of the evidence necessary to investigate the death of Logan Gomez. Pilly Burton died in a different coronial jurisdiction, and no inquest has been opened for her. Uh, we have received representations to include her death in the investigations of the deceased, but no detailed submissions or supporting evidence has been provided to show how Pilly Burton's death was related to the fire. The circumstances surrounding Pilly's death were addressed in the Phase 1 report, and although there will be no presentation in this module in relation to her, nonetheless, uh, you, the panel, have offered to include in your report a description of the circumstances of Pilly's death in recognition of the regard in which she was held by her community. The vast majority of circumstances in which each deceased came by their deaths was in the first place the subject of findings of fact already made in the Phase 1 report, both generically and individually, and in the second place will be made in the Phase 2 report on the basis of the evidence and the submissions heard in Modules 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6. There is, in addition, evidence before the panel of facts relevant to the deaths of each of the individual deceased which would be required to be found by the coroner. Now, against that background, uh, I'd like to explain a little bit about the nature and purpose of this module. It is to present to you, the panel, the facts relevant to the deaths of each individual deceased based on the evidence before you that the coroner is obliged to investigate. The facts must be the facts that I, as counsel to the inquiry, would otherwise have presented to you in a neutral way, based firmly on the evidence in the record or the findings made in the Phase 1 report. You, the chairman, have always been of the view that it would encourage a greater sense of agency and ownership of this very sensitive and personal element of the inquiry for it to be conducted by the bereaved's own representatives and not by counsel to the inquiry. It is for that reason that the RLRs for the bereaved are going to conduct the presentations. In that sense, these RLRs are taking on a different role from that which they occupied during other parts of the inquiry. It's important to make clear that the presentations do not represent the findings of you, the panel, and although uh, they will refer to findings made in the Phase 1 report, there are matters of evidence, such as Professor Peirce's evidence heard last week, where you, the panel, have yet to make findings. The inquiry has been concerned that some bereaved might, perhaps not unnaturally, wish their representatives to point the finger at particular people or organisations who they consider are to blame for the deaths of their loved ones. As to that, there are two things to say. First, so far as concerns generic causes, general causes and contributing factors, the inquiry has already received voluminous written opening and closing submissions and oral submissions from the RLRs in each of their earlier modules and all other core participants have had a fair opportunity to make their own submissions and to respond to those allegations. That can be supplemented through the procedure adopted for the overarching final submissions now scheduled for the second week in November this year, which will include provision for updates based on the expert evidence, including expert evidence from Professor Purser. Uh, secondly, so far as concerns specific individual cases and causes and contributing factors, 
Those are essentially physiological, derived from the work of Professor Purser and the work of the pathologists, whose post-mortems could be and were carried out. Moreover, you, the panel, are not a coroner. You're not obliged to adopt any particular procedure that a coroner would adopt, and it is in any event not permitted for you to exceed <coughs> the ambit of the terms of reference. There will be no submissions in this module seeking to persuade you to consider a particular or indeed any coronial conclusion <coughs> because the panel does not have, you do not have the jurisdiction to make and record any such conclusion. You are not here in place of the coroner, but rather to assist her in fulfilling her statutory functions and obligations. Her, her investigations, suspended though they are, remain and must remain a separate independent process. Accordingly, the RLR's presentations in this module will not be seeking to apportion responsibility for the deaths to any specific person, act, event, or omission. They will not use contentious language, nor should there be a need to display documents considered already as part one of the phase report, phase one report, or which are distressing. We are very grateful for an express assurance on behalf of all the RLRs for the families, the BSRs directly involved in Module 8, that all counsel making the presentations during the module will present the facts in an uncontroversial way. And we'll, do, we'll, we'll avoid making submissions, arguments, or allegations against other core participants or third parties. That approach will assist the inquiry team and the RLRs for the bereaved together to achieve their shared goal and that goal is to permit a dignified, sensitive, and meaningful presentation of the core facts relevant to each death. Those in turn will provide a memorable and, and fitting a close to the phase one, phase two commemor uh, to, the, to phase two, as the commemorations of the deceased did as the opening to phase one in May 2018. It must go without saying that each RLR must be free to address you unimpeded and uninterrupted by me or by you. The dignity of the deceased and the solemnity of these hearings demands that. If there are any occasions on which the presentations touch on matters beyond the scope of the very limited set of facts that have been agreed as relevant, then unless already covered in the evidence heard in earlier modules, they will not be taken into account in the report. If there are contentious allegations on matters within the scope of those facts, then no findings will be made in the report without giving those against whom those allegations are made a fair opportunity to address them at a later stage on which directions would have then to be given. But I hope uh, that the assurances that we've been given will render that unnecessary. We will start today by hearing evidence from the forensic pathologist, Dr. Ashley Fegan Earl, and from Gail McKinnon, the forensic anthropologist. On the 11th of July, 2022, next Monday, we will hear evidence from Dr. Carl Harrison, forensic archeologist. Those witnesses will explain how they went about their work to identify the deceased and the immediate causes of death. On the other days from tomorrow, we will hear the presentations from the RLRs for the bereaved. The RALRs have organised the timetable in consultation with the inquiry team. It contains built-in breaks of appropriate length between presentations so that each presentation stands alone and is not treated simply as part of a process, while balancing the need for a timetable that is proportionate. The inquiry team has confirmed with RLRs which documents need to be displayed during a presentation, which will minimise the risk of any interruption. For many bereaved, their chance to hear about the circumstances in which their loved ones died is the culmination of five years of waiting, five years of material that at times must have seemed very far removed from the ones they lost, who they were, and how they died. Although we must apply sensible procedures and timekeeping to ensure a process that is fair for all, the individual need to speak and be heard is paramount and we all allow time and space around each presentation, as we did at the commemorations in May 2018, with which we started the inquiry. Finally, I should give a general trigger warning now. The statements and the materials that will be discussed 
or display during this module may be distressing to some and they may wish to consider whether to listen or to continue to listen or to watch or to continue to watch or not. A trigger warning will be given at the start of every session, including after all breaks throughout this module. Mr Chairman, members of the panel, that is all I propose to say by way of opening Module 8. Thank you very much, Mr Millett. Um, now, I now call, <coughs> hot on the heels of that, uh, Dr Ashley Fegan Earl, please, the pathologist. Good morning, Dr. Viganel. Uh, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I understand that you wish to affirm, is that yes, right? Indeed. The words should be there on the screen in front of you. Would you read them out, please? I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Would you like to sit down, please? Make Thank yourself you very comfortable. Much indeed. Yes, Mr. Millett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm. Mr. Chairman, I, I perhaps should have done, done this before calling Dr. Fegan Earl, but I repeat the trigger warning that I've just given generally. I, I perhaps wasn't necessary uh, only a minute or two later. I should explain generally that Dr. Fegan Earl is being called to provide an overview of the process and the methods by which he and his colleagues proceeded. We will not be asking him questions about any individual deceased circumstances, and I hope that might provide some comfort to the BSRs. Um, Dr. Figanel, yeah. um, can I please ask you to, to be shown AWF701? Uh, is that your witness statement prepared for the inquiry? Yes, it is. And if we go, please, to page five, we can see that there's a date, uh, 15th of June 2022, underneath your name and a signature. Is that your signature? It is indeed, yes. Uh, and can you have you read this statement recently? Yes, I have. Thank you. And can you confirm that the statements made in this statement are true? Yes and certainly true to the best of your knowledge and belief. Certainly so. And although you are not here as an expert, is it right that in preparing this statement you have remained mindful of your professional obligations in the same way that you would have been or would have done had you been called as an expert? Yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, preparing a report to the court? Indeed. Now, I, I'm going to take you to a number of points in the statement as we go through your evidence, but we will have to jump around a little bit, of so course. forgive me. But everything I'm going to ask you about will appear on the screen in front of you. Um, can we turn, please, to page one of your uh, statement? And the pages one and two contain your professional qualifications and experience. And yes. what I would just, just want to do is, is invite you, is in a sense, to agree a list of the main uh, characteristics of your career and your professional qualifications. You completed a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, yes? Yes. And you held a diploma in medical jurisprudence in pathology? Yes. And I think you also uh, hold fellowships in the uh, at the Royal College of Pathologists? Yes. And I think you're a foundation member of that, are you not? Uh, not of the Royal College of Pathologists, the, the, the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine, I am. R uh, right. Uh, and then the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine, you're also a member, uh, and, a, and the British Association of Forensic Medicine. Yes. Uh, and also, I think, the Royal Society of Medicine. Yes. Yes. Uh, if we could turn over to the, to the top, please, of page two, um, you can see that you are also a member of the British Academy of Forensic Sciences. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, you are also say it's back on page one, but we didn't get back to it, that you've been involved in the study and the practice of forensic pathology since 1997. Yes. And you practice as an independent forensic pathologist as a partner in a, uh, an organisation called Forensic Pathology Services. Yes, indeed. Yes. And in, in 2002, is this right, you were admitted to the Home Office Register of Accredited Forensic Pathologists? Yes, I was. And is it also right that to be admitted to that register, a candidate would have to meet certain criteria, which would include holding a specialist registration in one of four areas of pathology or forensic medicine? Yes, that's right. And I think you would also need to be aware of uh, the coronial legislation so far as it affects the work of a pathologist. Yes, absolutely. And, and um, are you able briefly to outline what the work of a forensic pathologist involves? Yes, uh, forensic pathologists are all qualified doctors who've gone on to specialise in forensic uh, pathology, which itself considers uh, causation of injuries and causes of death 
in uh, usually overtly suspicious circumstances, but that can involve a very wide range uh, of issues such as uh, murder, suicide, accident, uh, and indeed uh, mass disasters. Um, uh, we are independent as pathologists. Uh, we are not, uh, while we may be instructed by a coroner to perform post-mortem examinations, our opinions are independent. Uh, so while we work with police, we do not uh, have to consider their uh, specific uh, requirements or, or opinions. We, we provide an independent response uh, to our findings. So we're engaged in carrying out those post-mortem examinations, um, commissioning additional uh, investigations, collating that, providing reports and opinions, and expressing those to various courts. And would it be fair to say that a forensic pathologist carries out a post-mortem on the authority of the coroner or the police? Uh, on, always on the authority of the coroner, although, of course, the police may have a specific interest. Yes, and I think you've explained that that happens where there has been a suspicious or unnatural death. Yes. Yes, and then you report on your opinion as to the medical cause of death yes. to the relevant authority. We do. Now, you, you also say that you've co-authored papers in your own area of expertise and you've lectured to a range of other professionals on forensic pathology. Yes, is that right? it is. And I think you maintain your professional accreditation through continuing professional development uh, under a scheme organised by the Royal Co College of Pathologists. Yes, it's a requirement of all doctors to, to carry out that. So. Yes. Uh, would it be a fair summary of your experience over many years that it has included conducting post-mortems and providing expert opinions, both in inquests and in a range of criminal cases? Yes. And other cases too? Uh, yes, indeed, yes. Such as? Uh, various appeals, uh, mass disaster inquiries, um, cold case reviews and the like. Right. Now, before the Grenfell Tower fire in June 24, uh, 2017, had your work as a forensic pathologist included investigating the cause of death following a serious fire? Uh, yes. And which, which was that? Uh, well, many uh, fires which are deemed to be uh, suspicious, including um, murders uh, where arson has been the underlying uh, cause um, and fire arising from mass disasters, for example, uh, the Paddington crane, train crash. Yes, and I think it's right also that you gave evidence... Uh, is this right, as a pathologist in the London Bridge inquest? Yes, I've been involved in all of the London terrorist incidents over the last few years. Yes. Now, um, can we go please to page five of your witness statement? And let's look together at paragraph 39. You say, it is to be noted that all of these examinations were performed by Home Office registered pathologists, several of whom had experience of mass, previous mass disasters, including road and rail crashes and terrorist incidents in which similar basic principles are applied. Now, we'll come back to the basic principles, but just to be clear at this stage, is it right that those involved with the post-mortems which followed the fire, the Grenfell Tower fire, were all registered with the Home Office? Yes, they were. Um, therefore, they, they had a broad experience of uh, similar uh, types of cases and uh, were aware of the principles that are applied to, to dealing with such cases. And when you say similar types of cases, are you ref what are you referring to? Uh, other, other mass disasters such as, for example, the Croydon tram crash, the Paddington rail crash, uh, uh, various other rail crashes, road crashes, um, terrorist incidents. All of those are unified by um, a specific process that we go through in order uh, to carry out those examinations and report our findings. Right. Uh, and had you personally had experience of a mass, uh, a mass incident, a mass casualty incident involving a serious fire, a large, where there was a large number of casualties? He certainly, probably Paddington uh, rail crash was, was a significant uh, incident like that, yes. Now, if we go back to page two of your statement, I just want to ask you about your process at Grenfell in, uh, in relation to the post-mortem examinations. At paragraph six, you say this, whilst there exist principles for the management of a mass disaster, 
it is to be recognized that no two disasters are the same. Uh, and then um, you go on to say, uh, in paragraph 39 we looked at, um, where there are some principles which would apply. What are the basic principles that you refer to in paragraph 39, even though mass disasters are never the same? The basic principles would involve um, preparation of a strategy um, that is specific to the disaster involved, considering which individuals would be best placed to carry out those investigations, what interface there may be with other areas of expertise to um, maximise the potential of evidence recovery and information recovery, um, and to ensure that there is a logical staged uh, process uh, that goes through each case individually uh, and ensures uh, that all the questions that need to be answered uh, are, are done so. Um, and each of those processes is accounted for um, as the process continues with reporting to the coroner as we go. And is having a nominated lead pathologist uh, one of those principles or a, a yes, procedural matter which governs them? Yes, because... Uh, the, the lead pathologist will have an interface with the coroner so that on a day-to-day -day basis various important uh, decisions can be made as to how the investigation proceeds. And as the nominated lead pathologist, was it your role in relation to the Grenfell Tower mass uh, incident to apply the basic principles that you've just explained to us? Yes, indeed. Uh, and so it was you who made the decisions about the approach that, that the pathology team would take? Yes, we put forward a strategy that was discussed, uh, among others, with, with Her Majesty's Coroner uh, in order that uh, her requirements were properly fulfilled and uh, the investigation proceeded um, in, a, in a logical fashion, given its scale. Now, although you say in paragraph 6 that you recognise that no two disasters are the same, uh, were there any particular challenges that you and your colleagues in your pathology team faced at Grenfell? Uh, yes. Um, the issue, of course, here is fire. Uh, fire is a highly destructive medium. And so it may be that we are unable to carry out in the conventional sense post-mortem examinations. And therefore, we may require... Um, to interface with other uh, experts um, who can provide us with vital information in order to come to a proposed cause of death. And that would include, for example, um, forensic archaeologists, um, forensic odontologists, and forensic anthropologists. Um, and therefore, it required each case to be considered on merit uh, as to which expert would be most be would be best place to carry out that investigation with oversight from a pathologist. And when you say each case, do you mean each individual? Each individual, deceased? yes, indeed. I see. Uh, and did you, was it you who went about deciding first whether each deceased needed an archaeologist or an anthropologist or an odontologist, and if so, deciding who that person should be? Well, to an extent, it was decided that the pathologist would um, make the initial examination and from there decide whether a conventional post-mortem examination was possible or appropriate, or indeed whether it was more in the province of um, the anthropologists and odontologists. Thereafter, referral would be made to those experts reports would come back to us so that we could ultimately define a cause of death. And to what extent, and we may come back to this later, but to what extent could the uh, anthropologists or the odontologists uh, give you any assistance in the decision about the cause of death as opposed to the identity of the person who died and where they died? Well, the odontology is principally uh, an identification process, mm. as is largely the, uh, the, the anthropology. It's, it, it's taking uh, account of each case and very much placing uh, each individual into the context of the disaster as a whole and 
drawing conclusions as best we can, um, given the the unique limitations um, that we, we were we were facing here. Yes, and, and was it you who selected the the particular archaeologist? And anthropologist and the odontologist. <laughs> no, they'd already been engaged. Uh, there was a team um, of both, both or, of all three of those individuals, sets of individuals, um, and and we work alongside those within within the mortuary. I see. Engaged by the coroner. Engaged by the coroner. Yes. I follow. Um, turning to your own team, I think it's right, isn't it, that including you, twelve forensic pathologists were involved in conducting post mortems on the deceased at Grenfell. Yes. And who chose uh, your colleagues? Did you? Yes, it, it was it was largely undertaken by um, my particular group. Um, we cover um, the metropolitan area and many of the home counties, and so, um, given the location, we we were able to to deploy appropriate individuals to to deal with this. Uh, and uh, were you responsible f for picking the individual members of your team? Yes. And you led them, did you? Yes. Yes. And how did you instruct them or monitor their work? Uh, on, on a daily basis by discussing um, the strategies that had been uh, considered on a day-to-day -day basis and ensuring that those were implemented um, as, as we went through and then perhaps modifying the techniques um, as we were presented with further challenges. And how did you ensure consistency of approach across different post-mortem examinations? Um, well, all cases um, are, are reviewed, are peer-reviewed. Um, all of the home office pathologists are used to uh, secondary review. Um, and um, with regard to the uh, anthropology, that would be a matter for the anthropologist to internally review their own findings. And who conducted the peer reviews on the post-mortems done by your team? That would have been um, various individuals within our, our, our particular unit. Um, that's a common feature of all cases conducted by home office pathologists, that they are peer reviewed prior to a formal report being issued. The peer reviewed by your own? Yes, it's, it's a, what's termed a critical conclusions findings check. In other words, that the... the um, Broadly speaking, the conclusions match the findings um, uh, in, in a consistent manner. Right. But nobody um, had a second look at your methodology? No. Okay. Uh, and is it right that in some cases different pathologists conducted examinations of the remains of a single victim, but at different stages? Yes, but that's because of the uh, extent of disruption of the bodies uh, that there, there was overlap in that case. Is that usual in a mass casualty incident? It depends very much on the extent of damage to bodies, but where there is greater disruption, yes, that, that may occur. Now, we know from the available reports that for many of those who died in the fire, there was a preliminary post-mortem report, which was then followed at a later stage by a final post-mortem report. Yes. Uh, and is, was the two-stage process explained by what you've just told us about disruption? Uh, to an extent, yes. Um, again, in all home office cases, we will provide a preliminary report which indicates our findings and a cause of death if we can give one. It also highlights what further investigations are required such that once those have been received, they can be reviewed and a final um, post-mortem examination report issued. I see. So, just to help me, so you always provide a preliminary report? Yes. And is it, is it the case that sometimes, because of further investigations which are required, you go on and produce a final report? Yet the, a final report will always be, be, be produced. There's, there's almost inevitably various additional examinations and investigations that will be carried out that need to be taken into account. Uh, the provision of a preliminary report allows the coroner uh, the capacity to, to open an inquest at the very least. Yes, I see. But, but, but there would always be a preliminary, yes. and there would always be a final. Yes. But, but um, would, would it be often the case that the final and the preliminary would be the same? <sighs> Usually they would be a separate document. Right. Now, if we go to paragraph 20 in your <coughs> statement, please, page 3, 
Uh, we can see there that you refer to the early phases of the investigation. You say, in the early phases of the investigation, the victims were largely intact. Um, now, what did you mean there by early phases? In a, in a way, this refers to the body recovery um, from whom you'll undoubtedly hear from appropriate individuals. It was the case that early on, the individuals who were recovered were intact and had not been uh, in the presence of severe fire. And for that reason, formal post-mortem examinations could be conducted in the normal sense. Later on, when there was more destruction, uh, that led to the uh, diversification of techniques uh, uh, which were necessary at that point. Um, was the investigation formally structured into phases so that the early phases would focus on those victims whose bodies were largely intact? No, not specifically. It, it, it was a function of um, admitting each body into the mortuary, assessing what was the most appropriate investigation and examination, and moving forward from there. It, it happened that, by nature of the recovery, the first bodies recovered were the most intact. And as further um, recovery proceeded, there was more destruction. Is that because of the logic of the process? Yes, the logic of the process in that, of course, it's likely they would start lower down and move, move upwards into more fire-damaged areas. Yes, I see. Uh, now, if we go to um, uh, paragraphs uh, 14 and 16 under the heading post-mortem examination process at the top of your screen on page three. Uh, this is the part of the statement where you address the post-mortem examination process. Are you able to outline for us the process from the recovery of human remains to the receipt of those remains in the designated mortuary? Yes, uh, when remains are, are recovered, uh, they're placed into a recovery bag and they are assigned a unique number. Um, that is common across all mass disasters. Um, it allows for um, a continued study of the individual through the process until identification has been achieved. So it ensures there's no um, confusion in identification uh, or any, any form of mix-up. So we ensure that we have that number and then that's audited throughout the process by various individuals. In paragraph 16, you say, upon receipt into the designated mortuary, Westminster Public Mortuary, each bag underwent a CT scan. Yes. Uh, uh, is that... Uh, well, um, I think the East Midlands Forensic Pathology Group then remotely reported on those scans. Yes. Yes. It, just to be clear, is it right that every recovery bag, which is what I think they're called, uh, underwent a CT scan? Yes, that's right. And what was the purpose of the CT scan? Um, Post-mortem CT scans are becoming a more common um, adjunct to uh, investigations, and uh, their detail may allow, for example, uh, to uh, consider various positive identifiers, um, for example, um, hip replacements, um, surgical implants, um, anatomical abnormalities. Um, equally, it, it allowed for consideration as to whether the bag contained um, a single body or whether there was a suggestion of so-called commingling of remains. Um, and of course, that would be at a later phase when there was more destruction. Um, so that there was early consideration of how uh, the investigation of that particular recovery bag would proceed. Uh, and just taking that a little bit more in stages, therefore, uh, use the CT scan assists in identifying human remains through positive identifiers such as you've mm. uh, given us examples of. Is it also for recording purposes? 
Yes. Of the audit trail. Yes, indeed. And are there any limitations to the use of a CT scan in identifying human remains? Well, in so much as um, it can look for identifying features, but there will become an interface whereby a CT scan will not identify as much as a careful examination from a, uh, a forensic anthropologist. And what safeguards were put in place to maintain the integrity of the remains during that stage of the process? Well, the, the bags were sealed um, and, and underwent uh, a scanning in a, in a mobile unit that was present at the mortuary. Right. Uh, and thereafter, where are they kept? Uh, the, the bodies were, were kept within the, the mortuary facility at right. Westminster. And was there any particular reason why the East Midlands Pathology Group was asked to report on the CT scan? Yes, Professor Rutty, who's the, the head of the unit, has a particular interest in post-mortem CT scans. Um, as a group, um, home office pathologists are open to discussing with fellow groups and asking for assistance give you a good example the London bombings we used um, pathologists from other um, other units um, and so we felt it was a, a very useful additional investigation that would assist in the smooth running. And just to be clear were, were all the scans reported on? Yes they were. Yeah. Um, looking back then at paragraph 18 on the screen in front of you uh, you say, in some cases, this allowed for the identification of unique identifiers. Just pausing there, uh, is that phrase, unique identifiers, what you just told us, namely positive identifiers, such as hip replacements and the like? Yes, so features that might be utilised as part of the process to secure positive identification of the deceased. Yes, and then you go on, or indeed the potential for the commingling of the remains. Did, did that, does that mean that a CT scan can help identify where there has been commingling of human remains? Yes, potentially, and, and therefore at an early stage um, that will allow uh, intervention by uh, the forensic anthropologist in order to carefully um, separate the remains and ensure that, that um, the remains of an individual deceased is as complete as possible and not mixed with any other remains. How would a CT scan help <coughs> identify commingling? Well, in terms of identifying perhaps numbers of bones, if there's an, a, an incorrect number of bones, for example. Three thigh bones. Uh, then sticking with page three, Looking at paragraphs 19 to 21, just looking at those paragraphs, you explain there that each recovery bag was assessed by a forensic pathologist and then a decision was made uh, about whether a conventional post-mortem examination could be performed. Um, was it just for the individual pathologist to determine whether a conventional post-mortem could be performed, or was that decision by made, made by you as the lead? No, that would be for an individual home office pathologist to, to make in the they know the limits of their expertise and they know when to ask for assistance from further, uh, uh, further um, specific uh, specialties. I, I see. So did you get involved in the decision about whether a full post-mortem in the traditional sense could be undertaken with particular recovery? Not specifically. In a, in a sense, that was a self-selecting process that was undertaken by the individual pathologist. And if you look at paragraph 21... You say, in such cases, a full post-mortem examination was undertaken, including both external and internal examination, and, where possible, including ancillary investigations such as histology and toxicology. C can you expand a little bit more on the types of ancillary investigations that would be conducted? Um, yes, uh, histology refers to the uh, microscopic study of uh, tissues, um, in, in a situation such as this, for example, one may be looking for confirmation of sooty deposits in the airways, which would confirm inhalation of fire fumes and smoke uh, from the environment deep into the lungs. Equally, if samples are available, toxicology can be performed in order to consider whether there was carbon monoxide in the blood 
which I'm sure you've heard about, a, a, a highly toxic um, uh, gas that binds with the blood, mm. and which we use uh, very frequently uh, to consider causes of death um, from smoke inhalation. Carbon monoxide is, is, is a very common um, cause of, of poisoning in such fires. In general terms, what factors would affect the type of examination or ancillary investigation that a pathologist could carry out? Uh, that would be largely um, governed by the integrity of the body or otherwise. Um, so the level of burning or otherwise would um, certainly factor in there. Um, and it then becomes a decision as, as, as to whether the pathologists are best placed to investigate or whether it's more an anthropological investigation. If you turn then to uh, page 3, paragraph 20, uh, where you've referred to the fact that in the early phases the victims were largely intact, as you say, and then look at page 4, paragraphs 36 to 37, at the foot of the screen, you say, where a full post-mortem examination could be performed, it was for the individual pathologist to provide a cause of death based on their observations. This is why some causes of death appear different or more refined, given the greater detail of the greater level of detail that could be applied to such an examination. Uh, are you able to say uh, a little bit more about why it was possible to do that in such cases? Yes, to provide because... a more refined cause of death. If you are able to carry out a full external and internal examination, you're able to comment on uh, any injuries that may be present. Um, you are able to comment on whether there's positive evidence of inhalation of fire fumes. You're able to comment on whether there's any natural disease that may be relevant, for example, heart disease that may make an individual more vulnerable in the setting of a fire. You're able to confirm your diagnoses by microscopic examination, and you're able to investigate whether there's evidence of carbon monoxide poisoning by submitting samples for toxicological examination. So in other words, from that complete array of investigation, you're able to give a very full and accurate cause of death, which reflects not only the primary cause, but any contributory factors that, that may be relevant. And this is why uh, those individuals who had a full post-mortem examination may have what appear to be much fuller causes of death. And is it the case that the amount of detail given about the cause of each death uh, might vary depending not only on the variations of level of detail available from each post-mortem and the state of the recovery, but also perhaps as a matter of practice as between pathologists? Yes, uh, it, um, to an extent uh, each pathologist um, uh, applies their opinion to each case, but in, in broad terms the, the, there would be no discrepancy and, and, and I'd refer back again to the fact that these were cross-checked by other Home Office pathologists to ensure that there was um, uh, consistency between conclusions and cause of death given. Now, at paragraph 23, if we go back a page to page 3, you say that a different approach was required later in the investigation when rem the remains recovered <clears throat> were in a more advanced state of heat damage. Can you outline for us, please, the pathological approach that was adopted in such cases? Yes. Uh, when, when the individuals were presented in a far more disrupted state, um, the reality is that forensic pathology cannot offer uh, an appropriate investigation. In those situations, it is far more appropriate for a forensic uh, anthropologist to study the remains, given that their expertise lies in uh, the study of skeletal remains and highly disrupted remains. They're able to apply their skills to consider perhaps age, sex, stature of an individual. Um, uh, they're able to relate um, 
bones, for example, to one another and ensure, where possible, each individual is completely accounted for as an individual um, rather than uh, a mixing, this is the term commingling I've used before, of, of remains. It's very much within their, their area of expertise. But I just want to be clear that we're drawing a distinction here between identification yes. and uh, cause of death. Yes. Uh, and is it right that your, um, if it, well, the forensic odontologists, archaeologists uh, and anthropologists uh, are called on in those more, more disrupted cases yes. to identify with, with a reasonable level of confidence the deceased rather than to opine upon the cause of death? Yes, that's correct. Right. Now, um, are you able to give us some detail about how a number of things assisted in uh, formulating the cause of death? And I say a number of things, I have five. Let's start with toxicology. Are you able to tell us about how toxicology assists, assisted you as the pathologist or your team in, in uh, identifying the cause of death? Yes, with, with toxicology, you're able to, uh, specifically for carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, one looks at the level of carbon monoxide and what that means for an individual. Um, there are generally a series of ranges where you might expect on one end, for example, some degree of toxicity that might cause confusion, slowness of movement, up to levels that would usually be associated with death. So the toxicology may very much inform as to the cause of death. Um, and is taken into context with the findings of the, the other findings of the post-mortem examination because in those cases where toxicology was possible, it's likely that a full post-mortem examination was also going to be uh, undertaken. And the next one is DNA testing. Does yes. that help identify the cause of death or, or simply, I say simply, uh, alternatively, the uh, identity of the that's, deceased. That, that's a process for identification. And similarly, odontology, archaeology and anthropology, as I think you've confirmed. Same for all of those, yes. Yeah, yes, I see. Then let's turn to the medical cause of death in the final post-mortem reports. We know from the individual post-mortem reports that we have that for a majority of those who died in Grenfell Tower, the cause of death was recorded as 1A consistent with the effects of fire or yes. similar and in some cases, 1A, inhalation of fire fumes, or similar. Now, I'm going to come back to that formulation in a moment, but is it right, generally, that it's for the registered medical practitioner to provide a medical certificate of cause of death? Yes. And, is it, and this is part of the system in this country for the registration of deaths? Yes, it is. And is it right that completing such a certificate would be a matter for the medical professional rather than, for example, a toxicologist? That's right. Are you able to explain the certification system uh, used when giving a medical cause of death, by which I mean the 1A or 1B or 2 format? Yes. Um, the standard formulation uh, has two parts, a part 1 and a part 2. Part 1 describes what the primary cause of death is and may be subdivided. Part 2, and I'm sorry for the uh, complexity of it, describes conditions that may be contributory as opposed to primarily causative in nature. Um, so uh, to give you an example, one might say 1A, cardiorespiratory arrest due to 1B, carbon monoxide poisoning. And the way that follows then is 1A is due to 1B. It follows down a line. If, for example, the individual had severe heart disease, which would have worsened uh, their situation, one might put that under part two as a contributory factor. Um, so uh, in those cases where we were able to conduct a full post-mortem examination and consider the results of toxicology, we were able to give a full um, cause of death in the formulation that, that I've just described, and that's what you see in, in those various cases. Yes, thank you. And it goes without saying, or does it go without saying, that when giving a medical cause of death, a pathologist would be doing so on the evidence available at the time of the post-mortem? 
yes, on the evidence available to them, together with uh, the results of any additional investigations that allow them to potentially refine or modify the cause of death. One has to take account of the totality of the evidence available. And if additional information later emerged, mm -hmm. would it be right that the pathologist might be required to or might be at least willing to revise or refine the cause of death? All pathologists should be willing to revisit a cause of death in the light of novel information, yes. Uh, and sticking with well, your statement, please, page uh, four, if we can go to that, you say at paragraph 26, uh, in the purest sense then, for many of the victims whose bodies showed advanced heat damage, the cause of death could have been given as 1A unascertained. Mm. However, the view was taken that this would be a most unsatisfactory approach for relatives of the deceased. Uh, uh, what circumstances... Um, would have made it appropriate? To give unascertained? Yes. I think uh, to an extent that's, that's a matter of personal opinion. There are cases that we uh, engage with where the cause of death simply cannot be found um, after an exhaustive post-mortem examination um, or indeed if the body is disrupted for various reasons. Unascertained is, um, can be and is used as a, as a formulation when we simply can take matters no further. A view was taken that given the information that we knew that all of these individuals had been recovered from the seat of an intense fire, that it would be an absurdity uh, to simply leave unascertained as a cause of death. And so I think it was more reasonable to take a view <coughs> that one could apply a generic cause of death that at least gave a cause of death to a family within the limits of the pathological interpretation. And so if you go to paragraph 27, you say, as has been provided for other different disasters, it was agreed that in those cases where the full post-mortem examination process could not be performed, then a generic cause of death could be applied, namely 1A, consistent with the effects of fire. Yes. Can you explain who decided on that term? Uh, that was um, a decision that was taken during a strategy meeting with the coroner. Uh, I raised that as an issue, basing it on uh, previous mass disasters and, again, my opinion that I think it would be unreasonable to provide a bald cause of death as unascertained, given the overwhelming evidence of an intense fire from which all of these individuals were recovered. Now, in some cases, the medical cause of death was recorded as 1A, inhalation of fire fumes. Yes. And another inhalation, in others, inhalation of the products of combustion. Yes. Are you able to explain the difference, if any, between inhalation of fire fumes and inhalation of the products of combustion? I think that's just a matter of, of, of personal wording and reflects the different pathologists carrying out. Um, we all use slightly different wording. Um, they're essentially the same. In, in, in what circumstances would the cause of death be recorded as inhalation of fire fumes or inhalation of the products of combustion rather than consistent with the effects of fire? That would be where there is pathological evidence indicating that the individual inhaled fire fumes, in other words, smoke present within the airways, in the lungs, which we can identify both by naked eye examination and we back that up with microscope work. Or alternatively, where toxicology has been performed and confirms that uh, there's a high level of carbon monoxide for there to be that high level of carbon monoxide, there has to have been inhalation of those fumes such that the gas could bind with the blood and circulate and cause uh, 
cause carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, um, I think you know that the inquiry obtained an expert's report from Professor David Purser. Yes. And he heard his evidence over the course of two days last week. Yes. He's a physiologist and a diplomat member of the Royal College of Pathologists. And as a research scientist, he has extensive research experience in inhalation to toxicology and particularly in relation to the effects of combustion. Have you seen, or before today, a copy of his report? I have, yes, and I was able to watch some of his evidence. I was going to ask you, you saw some of his evidence. Yes. Can you just tell me which day you saw, do you think? Uh, on the Thursday. Thursday. Um, are you able to uh, explain, first, the physiological effects of coronary artery atheroma increasing one's susceptibility to carbon monoxide poisoning? Uh, yes. Um, if, if we start with carbon monoxide poisoning, um, carbon monoxide will bind to haemoglobin, which is the red pigment in blood that carries oxygen. It binds with it preferentially compared to oxygen. So effectively, you are blocking the supply of oxygen to the body. If you have coronary artery atheroma, which refers to furring up with fatty deposits of the um, main arteries that supply the heart muscle with blood, that further um, compromises the heart. So in a sense, you have a, a double jeopardy there, whereby on one part you are poisoned, you're not able to take up oxygen, and yet your heart can't even supply that because there's narrowing of those arteries. So it's, it's a, 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 an increased vulnerability um, to those individuals. So, so is it right that the presence of carbon monoxide doesn't affect the functioning of the heart, but does affect the ultimate delivery of oxygen? It, it, it does indeed. And in those cases, you're considering a heart which isn't capable of supplying the normal oxygen to the heart muscle because of the narrowing of those arteries. Now, we know that Professor Purser's analysis is detailed, uh, and he concluded that it was likely that most, if not all, of those who died in the tower were comatose and, in most cases, dead before being exposed to significant heat. And I'll just give you and everybody else, and indeed ourselves, the reference to that. That's a DAPR uh, 605, page 138, paragraph 584. Um, they'd, been un un they'd been rendered unconscious through exposure to gases, which included carbon, carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. And he accepted that the effect of carbon monoxide in combination with hydrogen cyanide as a cause of death could be described as asphyxia from asphyxiant gases. That was day 269, page 155. Sorry, day 296, sorry, day 296, that's the Wednesday, page 155 at line 5. Um, do, would you agree with that? Uh, I, I would agree that it's, in effect, a form of asphyxia, although one has to be careful of that term because it has many connotations, such as strangling. But, yes, the actual process is asphyxia, which in its purest sense means that the tissues of the body are critically deprived of oxygen, which are required to maintain life. And would you usually take that kind of evidence into account when deciding on the appropriate formulation for the medical cause of death? Yes, the, the toxicological findings um, where one can access them are, are always going to be an important additional feature to take into account. Uh, and if we stick with this page and look at paragraph 31, you say, it is therefore much more likely the case that in this disaster, individuals succumb to the effects of inhalation of these gases rather than dying specifically from burns and burning. Uh, and in the paragraph before that, you say that fire scientists and toxicologists may provide more details, but such gases would include carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, cyanide, and of course a profusion of carbon dioxide and lack of oxygen. Do, do, do you agree that, that um, what you're saying there and Professor Person's conclusion are consistent with each other? I, I think it's very much the case that uh, the majority, if not all, died from inhalation of fire fumes rather than burning. Um, 
that is my experience with a whole range of fires uh, that I have investigated. Um, it's not uncommon, of course, for bodies to become badly burnt uh, during the course of a fire and before they can be retrieved. But one is frequently able to identify that evidence of inhalation of fire fumes, soot in the airways, to look at the toxicology. So my view, yes, would be overwhelmingly uh, that uh, the deaths were likely inhalation of fire fumes rather than burning by flame. Yes, thank you. Now, if we leave aside those who fell from the tower, yes. given what you've just said and your observation uh, about, about uh, uh, asphyxia, would it be appropriate now to record the 1A medical cause of death as asphyxia from asphyxiant gases or perhaps inhalation of asphyxiant gases? The difficulty there is how far one goes. Professor Purser has given his evidence based on the scientific analysis of uh, Grenfell Tower, and I don't dispute those findings. It's how far one can go in providing a medical cause of death, given the limited pathological materials that were available. The cause of consistent with the effects of fire was given as a, a general term that was able to encompass the various ranges that were available, um, while emphasising that caveat that, in my view, and certainly in my experience, the majority of individuals who die in fires die from inhalation of fire fumes. Um, so that is the dilemma. Um, because I haven't got significant pathological material, can one take that further step and move towards an inhalation of fire fumes. And that, that, that is a, a, a difficult question. Um, a purist would suggest you, you, you cannot absolutely confirm that all deaths were inhalation of fire fumes, although the scientific evidence would strongly support that and pathological experience would strongly support that. And would you agree with an approach of providing an approximate time or perhaps a window of time when recording the times of death of those who died? Yes. You would. Um, Professor, those are all the questions I have for you. Sorry, Doctor <coughs> um, Figanel, those are all the questions I have for you at the moment. There may be other questions uh, occur to me uh, or others in a break, which I'm going to ask for now. Yes, of course. Uh, subject of that, those are the questions that I have. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yeah, it is, certainly, yes. Uh, Dr Frigner, just so you understand where we go from here, uh, at this point in the examination, we have a break so that Council can take stock, and others who are following the proceedings, not all from this room, can have a chance to suggest further questions. We also normally have a break at this stage in the morning anyway, so uh, I'm going to suggest that we break now until half past 11. That will give everyone a short break and also time to think up any additional questions. So that, that's what we'll do. We'll resume, please, at half past 11. And, and I should ask you, please, not to discuss your evidence with anyone should you get the chance to do so Indeed. while you're out of the room. Thank All you, right? sir. Thank you very much. Would you go to the usher, then, please? Thank you, Mr. Millett. Half past 11, then, please. Thank you. Okay.
Would you ask Dr. Fegan Earl to, uh, to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Doctor, we'll see if there are any more questions, shall we? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, there's one question, uh, uh, which is this. Um, are you able to explain the physiological effects of coronary artery atheroma increasing one's susceptibility to HCN intoxication, hydrogen cyanide intoxication? Yes, in, in so much as, um, by a slightly different mechanism, cyanide is also an what would be termed an asphyxiant gas. In other words, it, it, it prevents the body from appropriately utilising and taking up the oxygen required. So in the same setting, an individual with coronary heart disease, when faced with poisoning with both cyanide and carbon monoxide, will be far more vulnerable and susceptible to heart issues than an individual who has a normal heart. So it's, it's a broadly similar effect. Uh, could be possibly summarised with supply and demand. The, the heart requires that oxygen, um, but it's, it's being prevented from being uh, um, supplied. So the heart muscle is deprived of oxygen, and that's compromised by the furring up of the arteries. Right. Uh, and where one has a combination, let it be assumed, of carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. Yes. Uh, and also, the individual has a coronary artery atheroma. Would the presence of hydrogen cyanide together with carbon monoxide uh, be different uh, from the position if there was only carbon monoxide present? Yes, I suspect it would likely exacerbate the situation. Are you able to quantify that? I can't quantify it any further, but um, both being asphyxiant gases, um, the combination is likely to be additive. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Mr Chairman, I've got no further questions. Uh, Dr Figanel, thank you very much for your assistance. Uh, we're extremely grateful to you for coming here and explaining your work to us so that those listening can understand it more clearly. Thank you. Thank you. It's right that I should thank you as well, Dr Figanel. It's very important for all of us on the panel to understand uh, the work of the pathologist in general and, of course, in particular in relation to these, uh, these deceased. So we're very grateful to you for coming along to explain it all to us. Uh, and um, we thank you very much for doing so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, of course, you're free to go. That's great. Thank you. Mr. Millett, I understand we have another witness uh, who's waiting to be called, but I think it would be convenient for us to rise for a couple of minutes while arrangements are made. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Yes, Mr. Millett. Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the panel, in a moment I'm going to call Gail McKinnon. Uh, Gail McKinnon is a forensic anthropologist who was involved in the recovery and the post-mortem process uh, at Grenfell Tower. Uh, again, her evidence mm -hmm. contains facts and matters about the deceased's remains and the process of recovery, which many will find or might find distressing, and therefore I needed to raise that at this stage by way of a trigger warning so that those watching are aware of the contents of what is to follow and can choose now whether they follow or not. Uh, I should just also raise at this stage the fact that we intend only to deal with her evidence by way of generalities, uh, focusing on process and methodology uh, rather than in individual questions about individual deceased. Yes, so thank against you. Against that uh, general background, can I please now call Gail McKinnon? Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, uh, Ms. McKinnon. I, I understand you're going to affirm. Yes, thank you. Uh, the words should be there on the screen. Would you read them out, please? I do solemnly and sincerely and truly declare, and I affirm that the evidence I should give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please sit down, make yourself comfortable. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ms. McKinnon, you've prepared, I think, a witness statement for the inquiry, haven't you? Yes, yes. I did, Can we that's have, correct. Yes. Can we have that, please, at GMK601? Uh, and it's entitled Summary of the Forensic Anthropology Examination and Reporting Process. Uh, yeah. And you can see lower down your screen that there's a date, 14th of June, 2022. You see that? Uh, and a signature. Is that your signature? It is indeed. Can you, uh, have you read this uh, re summary uh, report recently? Yes, I have. And can you confirm that the statements made in it, so far as they're factual, are true to the best of your knowledge and That's belief? That's correct. And can you confirm that you've provided this report in the same way that you would have done to a court if you'd been appointed as an expert? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, can we please go to page 86, appendix 4, which sets out your background and experience relevant to the matters we're going to consider today and which were relevant to your role in the fire. Uh, I want just to pick out one or two points, if I may. First, I think you completed your BA in Western Asiatic Archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology, uh, UCL. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and a Master of Sciences in Osteology, Paleopathology and Funerary Archaeology at the University of Bradford. Yes? That's correct. And you're currently an honorary lecturer at Cameron Forensic Medical Sciences, William Harvey Research Institute, Barts, and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, and also the um, Queen Mary University. Correct. Yes. And a lecturer in forensic anthropology and module leader at the Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification within the Department of Life Sciences at the, at the University of Dundee until 2016. Correct. And I think that was between 2014 and 2016. That's correct. And a chartered forensic anthropologist since 2013. Yes. And I think you belong to the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. That's right. I'm a fellow and, of that institution. And if we go please to page 87, we see that you are a member of the expert panel for forensic archaeology at the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists and indeed have been since 2011. That's correct. Uh, and is it right also that until its closure in 2010, you were a certified anthropologist, certified forensic anthropologist at the Council for the Registration for Forensic Practitioners? That's correct. Uh, was that council replaced by another regulatory body after 2010? No, it wasn't. No, right. no. It, it, the, I think the disciplines then had to go to their own accreditation bodies rather than to have the overarching council. Uh, and you've been a consultant in forensic anthropology and archaeology since 1998. That's correct. And I think, is it right, you are currently the only duly accredited senior reporting forensic anthropologist and archaeologist in the UK? That's correct. And I think between 2013 and December 2021, you were the lead forensic anthropologist and the lead forensic archaeologist at Alecto Forensic Services. That's correct. And that is a forensic ecology service provider. Correct. And at the bottom of page 87, you say that your previous casework has encompassed investigations of terrorist incidents and disaster victim of identification, murder, suspicious and, uh, and unexplained deaths, child abduction, historic child abuse, slavery and servitude, missing persons, and clandestine grave search, location and recovery. That's correct. Yes. And if we go to page 88, is it right that, you, and just to summarise what you say, that you've um, 
also been involved in international cases, including international terrorist incidents, mass fatalities, and DVI, disaster victim identification. Yes. And also transport accidents and natural disasters like Haiti. That's right. And in fact, I think you'd give us some examples uh, <laughs> in that big middle paragraph, just to pick a few out. Uh, rather than reading it through, cool. World Trade Center terrorist attacks 2001. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. That's cool. London terrorist attacks in 2005. Mm -hmm. Yes. 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Correct. And the terrorist attack in Aminas, I think, in Algeria in 2013. Correct. Yes. And just a, a few more um, pointers. Um, I think you're a member of the British Academy of Forensic Sciences. Yes, that's correct. British Association for Forensic Anthropology. Correct. British Association in Forensic Medicine. Correct. Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. Correct. And the Royal Anthropology Institute for Great Britain and yes, Ireland. Yes, correct. Now, um, thank you very much for that introductory um, review. Uh, I want to ask you about your role um, during the Grenfell Tower fire investigations. Mm -hmm. Now, although you are dual qualified as an anthropologist and an archaeologist, is it right that your role in the Grenfell Tower investigations was confined solely to forensic anthropology. That's correct. I, I work solely in the mortuary of the City of Westminster public mortuary, so no. it's not at the tower. You weren't at the tower? No. Now, before we turn to look at your role and the role of your team following the fire, can you explain in general terms the role of a forensic archaeologist? Sorry, anthropologist. Anthropologist. Um, generally, we're hired uh, by the police force or, or by, uh, depending on the, the types of work, by a non-government organisation or the government to uh, identify unidentifiable human remains. So that's generally human remains that are um, disrupted, commingled, damaged, um, uh, fragmented in some way. And these human remains can um, emanate from things like terrorist incidents, natural disasters, or indeed it could be um, a single unidentified individual who may have been found um, in the woods or maybe buried and, and they don't, the police do not know who that person is. So our role within that investigation would be to construct a biological profile, that is looking at the age range of the individual, sex, ancestry, any individuating features that might help uh, the profile to assist the police in, in starting to look and narrow down who that person might be. And how does the role of a forensic anthropologist uh, relate to the role of a forensic archaeologist? Sometimes they're separate, so some individuals are forensic archaeologists and not anthropologists, but the archaeologist, forensic archaeologist is trained in the um, search and location and ultimately the excavation and recovery of human remains and those human remains can be clandestinely buried or they might be um, lying on the surface in a woodland or they might be recovered from a disaster or a terrorist incident. So the forensic archaeologist is trained to uh, record and recover, very carefully record locations of um, bodies. So in this instance and in instances of disaster victim incidents, um, it's looking at those integral and important relationships between one body and another, and in this case within Grenfell Tower, looking at the relationships and the positions and the locations of each deceased victim within a flat or a communal space to understand the relationships between one person and another before that person is recovered and brought to the mortuary for further examination. Can we go to page 20 of your report, please? And you tell us there at the top mm -hmm. that the forensic anthropologists and archaeologists are routinely deployed to mass fatality disasters, particularly when the condition of the bodies of deceased victims may be severely compromised mm -hmm. by commingling with the bodies of other deceased victims or where the remains are affected by varying states of preservation or decomposition, trauma, disruption, fragmentation, thermal damage, cremation, or differential body conditions that display a range of these characteristics. Correct. Uh, were those features present in relation to some or many um, bodies of the deceased at Grenfell? 
Certainly the, the bodies of victims that I and my team examined, uh, there was um, decomposition, but certainly trauma, thermal damage, disruption, fragmentation, um, disarticulation of limbs from torsos, um, and cremation. So obviously um, there was a lot of thermal damage to the human remains, and this is where the forensic anthropologists would be coming, um, coming in to assist the pathologists in ascertaining what level of examination um, needed to be undertaken in the short and the longer term to identify those individuals. And in relation to the way in which anthropologists and archaeologists work together, mm. uh, are you able to assist us, give us some insight into, the, 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 into their working? For example, would an archaeologist want to know what an anthropologist was looking for when carrying out their work? And would an anthropologist want to know how an archaeologist is going about their work? In order Absolutely. To so, so, you know, practitioners of both disciplines are, are um, if they're not accredited in both disciplines, will certainly know the requirements of um, what the other discipline needs. So, for example, for myself and my team in the mortuary, it was vital to have the forensic archaeology recording forms and the photographs and the, the illustrations, the hand-drawn drawings, to understand where each individual had been recovered from and understand um, the destruction within the flat. So that was um, integral to our examinations. And certainly, from the forensic archaeologist's point of view, they understood very clearly that the relationships between one deceased victim and another were very important if we were to, to recover and, and return as, as much of the human remains as possible to the families yes. of those individuals. So it, it was a symbiotic relationship and there was also um, a lot of daily communication through um, the authorities within the mortuary and within the tower to ensure that any changes or any, not difficulties, but any questions were, were relayed between one team and another through the post-mortem coordinators to ensure that um, you know, we were aware of what was going on at all times with each other. Now, if we go to page uh, eight, please, uh, we can see there uh, that uh, you describe in the first two paragraphs the f fact that there were four lead anthropologists Correct. and six anthropology assistants. That is the first paragraph on that page. Yes. Uh, were you the lead anthropologist? I was, yes. I led the team. And you, uh, you led the team. Mm -hmm. So, so it, when it says there were four lead anthropologists, were you the leader's leader? As it I were? was, yes. You were. So the, the four does not, do not include you? The four include me. Could, I, could you? Would you like to scroll yeah. further down the page? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> so there were four lead anthropologists, of which I was one, yeah. um, and also the team leader. Yes. So, yes, thank you. So four including you, and then six anthropology assistants. That's correct. And you say that they were deployed on a rotational basis between the 19th of June and the 15th of December 2017. That's right. That's right. And I think you were, um, you can see the names on the page there, Dr. Gillian Fowler, Dr. Nicholas Marquez Grant, and Alan Gabriel Canedo Robinson. Um, what did your role as, as team leader comprise? Um, the role was really a, a liaison between um, the post-mortem coordinators and uh, the coroner and the coroner's team. So often um, I had cases of my own to examine, but very often um, was uh, taken away to meetings and needed to be in an advisory role to, to other uh, disciplines and to the coroner um, and to the Metropolitan Police Service. So it was a role where um, I was undertaking several, several things at once in terms of advisory roles and how we went forward um, with the investigation. And looking at the three lead forensic anthropologists there named on the page on the screen, yes. what was their role? Their role was um, essentially to do um, each case uh, together. We, we, I'm sure we'll get on to this, but uh, each uh, flat was regarded as a fatal fire scene in terms of um, looking at the entirety of the flat, looking at the entirety of the recovery 
of uh, deceased victims from that flat and um, making sure that we, we were examining each person and then each person collectively. So that uh, is what uh, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Marquis Grant and Mr. Canada Robinson were doing on a daily basis and that's what I was participating in when I wasn't having to go to meetings and in advisory roles uh, with other disciplines. And did those lead forensic anthropologists work in each flat within the tower? I'm sorry? Did, he, did those for rent lead forensic anthropologists work within each flat in the tower? Physically? In, did they physically No, no, work? no, no. So my team were primarily, were, were in the mortuary. So we were looking at all the human remains that had been recovered from each flat on a flat-by-flat -flat basis. So, so, um, you, so your work as, an, as anthropology began uh, and ended effectively in the, within the mortuary? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. I see. Yeah. Did you supervise the work of the other anthropologies, anthropologists? Uh, supervision is the wrong word. I think it was, uh, it was a, um, we were constantly checking in with each other and ensuring that the process was running smoothly and the other disciplines were um, able to come and examine remains as we were examining them ourselves. So it was a, a collegiate role rather than a supervisory role. These lead the forensic anthropologists are very experienced in what they do. <coughs> and if you turn to page nine, please, <coughs> you can see that you set out there um, a list, <coughs> excuse me, a list of assistant forensic anthropologists. What, were, what was their role? Their role was to provide assistance with laying out um, the skeletal remains. So the vast majority <coughs> of the deceased victims that we examined had been catastrophically disrupted um, by the thermal damage and the effects of the fire. So in many, many cases, the URN, so that's a unique reference number um, of that uh, those particular remains uh, might be fragmented skeletal remains. Um, so our assistants, who are all very experienced, um, would lay them out and would be part of the process of preparing um, each URN <laughs> for examination by the lead forensic anthropologist and ensuring that um, the photography, initial photography and DVI <coughs> excuse me, police documentation had been completed before the lead uh, forensic anthropologist began their examinations. And if we go to page 13, in the first paragraph on that page at the top of your screen, uh, you say, uh, the forensic anthropological examination of the victims from the Grenfell Tower incident was conducted within the multidisciplinary framework of the Interpol Disaster Victim Identification DVI and post-mortem PM data collection and documentation systems. That's right. Yes, uh, and that's called the Interpol Disaster Victim Identification Guide 2014. These internationally recognised documentation systems were used in conjunction with the forensic anthropology protocols and working practices that were developed by the Grenfell Tower Forensic Anthropology Team in order to assist the victim identification process of the victims of this incident. Yes. Uh, a number of questions there. How, the, how does your role interact with that of the DVI teams? The DVI team within the mortuary were um, police officers who had been trained within the Interpol DVI um, system. So uh, I can't answer to how that training is conducted, but it's certainly the case that DVI trained police officers are uh, uh, very used to filling out the, the guideline forms and um, they are very integral at the start of the process when the, the victim first comes into the mortuary to um, log personal effects and log condition of the body and essentially look for, for any identifying paperwork or documentation that person might have. So that's a, a police role that occurs um, potentially with or without any further expert expertise such as pathologists, anthropologists, odontology, fingerprints. So that is a police process. Um, and these forms have been developed by Interpol to assist um, countries, particularly countries that might not have a DVI capacity um, or have never been confronted with operational situations such as, as this incident. Right. 
And so is this right, that the Interpol DVI uh, guide or the framework brings together a number of different disciplines, such as identification from documents, uh, uh, archaeology yes. uh, and anthropology? Yes, personal effects, fingerprints, yeah. And what other disciplines were involved in the multidisciplinary framework? Well, certainly for this disaster and for this um, operation within the mortuary, uh, pathologists, uh, odontologists, to identify um, the, the teeth and the dentitions of deceased victims. I believe fingerprints, but of course, very early on, it must be stated that um, individuals who were recovered by the fire brigade from the stairwells and communal spaces, and in some cases outside the building, um, we had no part of that um, examination, so I don't know if fingerprints were undertaken. Um, I believe they were. And molecular biology, so that's the DNA scientists who were from the Metropolitan Police, um, who would come in, um, certainly in the early stages, and, um, and take the samples for DNA identification. And would they come into the mortuary for those? Would they, would they collect the samples at the scene? Well, I can only speak for what I saw when our team started, but certainly the early post-mortems, I believe, DNA was being taken, but I'm not sure who did that. It was perhaps the pathologists or a combination of pathologists and biologists, but I don't know. I can't say. If we sure. scroll to the bottom of page 13, you say this, in, by reference to the Interpol guide. Part A of the guide contains high-level reference material in respect to the conduct of DVI operations although there is further extensive detailed information that can be accessed through linked ex- an- annexures in part B of the guide. Mm. These linked annexures outline operational and, and procedural information designed to inform the main technical aspects of conducting a DVI operation. They can also provide standardised approaches for practitioners, although the content remains sufficiently broad enough to allow for varying international practices or circumstances. Yes. Uh, are you able to explain how that general approach worked at Grenfell or how it informed the work that you and your team carried out? It certainly informed the work um, that the police officers uh, were tasked, the DVI police officers were tasked to undertake at the initial stages of um, human remains being examined. It's certainly also the case that these standardised approaches for practitioners um, are reasonable for us to appoint, but because of the nature of the disaster, they necessarily have to be adapted. So um, for us, this is why over a period of time, the forensic anthropology guidelines were developed to, to encompass the nature of the disaster that we were dealing with. So you know, commingled, very commingled in some cases, disrupted, fragmented, calcined, cremated human remains. So obviously, if, if there was another kind of disaster, a fairy disaster or an earthquake, you wouldn't get that level of disruption or thermal damage. And therefore, your guidelines for forensic anthropology and indeed how these annexures for the International DVI Guide were filled out would be very different. And if we go to page 16, please, in the fourth paragraph down there, you say... Following the initial post-mortem examination, extensive forensic anthropological examinations were then generally undertaken in a dedicated DVI temporary mortuary facility located adjacent to the city of Westminster public mortuary. Each examination of human remains was conducted on a flat-by-flat or communal space basis for the 17 separate recovery locations within Grenfell Tower where human remains were recovered by the forensic archaeological and DVI teams. The human remains that were recovered from each of these locations were examined at the same time by forensic anthropologists to ensure that all the remains from a particular flat or communal space could, where possible, be physically reassociated. Now you refer in the middle of the paragraph there to 17 separate recovery locations mm-hmm. within the tower. What were those? Uh, there were seven flats where the remains of a single individual were recovered. There were nine flats where a total of 46 individuals were recovered, and there was one communal space where two individuals were recovered. And when you refer to communal space, you're referring up to what, the stairs and the lobbies? Uh, Stairs, lobbies, lift lobbies, yes, that's right. Mm 
And when you say that the examination was conducted on a flat by flat or communal space basis, yes. are you able to expand a little bit on what you mean? Um, so the recoveries of the flats of the individuals within the flats, deceased victims, uh, was often quite difficult because of the health and safety and structural concerns for the building. So uh, in some cases, the flat would start to be examined and cleared by the DVI and forensic archaeologists, and then um, health and safety or uh, structural issues would, would mean that the teams would have to be removed from that individual flat and they would have to be retasked somewhere else until that flat had been made safe. So as far as we could, if we had already started examining um, deceased victims from a particular flat and then that flat had to be um, shut down whilst health and safety issues were resolved or structural issues were resolved, then uh, the individuals would be repackaged and returned to um, refrigerated storage until that flat could be re-examined because it hadn't been finished. So at all times we were attempting to have completed flats for examination, so the forensic archaeologists and the authorities at the tower would say it has now been cleared down to the bare concrete floor, there is nothing left here, so you can start you know, looking at the remains um, of deceased victims from this flat, and that's how it worked. But as I said, sometimes because of these concerns, we would have to f stop examining the remains from these flats and, and go back to them when we had confirmation that that flat had then been cleared. When you, when, when you say cleared, you mean cleared by the archaeologists? Cleared by the forensic archaeologists and the, the DVI teams, yeah. Yes, I see. Uh, and uh, when you concluded your work, were you satisfied uh, that uh, as much as possible had been recovered by the archaeologists so that you could carry out your function as an anthropologist? It, ha it was all recovered. So on, on um, two separate occasions, we visited the tower to see the work of the forensic archaeologists and the DVI officers. And certainly, I'm sure that those individuals will be able to, to go through their processes with you. But for us, um, as soon as the deceased victims had been recovered, um, that was not the end of the recovery process, because as you can imagine, the catastrophic destruction of the internal aspects of each flat meant that you know, furniture, plaster, concrete, all sorts of um, structural items needed to be cleared in order to ensure that no one else was present uh, and to ensure that every single item was physically examined and then removed. And the debris that uh, was left would be sieved through different uh, mesh sized sieves. And again, the forensic archaeologist will be able to tell you about that in order to collect the tiny bone fragments or t tiny fragments of human remains that may have been present. So once that sieving process had been done, um, it was uh, bare concrete floors. So I'm very confident that everything was recovered. Uh, then let's uh, turn down to, well, back rather, one page to page 15. And on page 15, you've given us an overview of the, op of the Operation Northley DVI Forensic Anthropology process. Yes. Uh, and if we zoom in on that, as we just have, um, are you able to talk us through that uh, flow diagram? Sure. This flow diagram is, is purely from my team's perspective, my discipline's perspective. So the arrival at the mortuary um, was conducted and overseen by uh, the DVI police officers. Uh, the, each individual victim and each um, URN containing fragmented commingled human remains was then sent through a mobile uh, computed tomography unit which came every week or every two weeks and was positioned outside the mortuary. 
those images were uh, sent up the line to um, Professor Guy <coughs> Rotti and his team at the University of Leicester, who, um, who reported on them um, in advance of the post-mortem examination. The preliminary assessment could be as simple as um, the URN being opened by police officers to check you know, what was inside and to check whether an individual had clothing or any IDs or documentation that might give an indication of who it was. Um, obviously, that didn't happen to, for the fragmented, commingled, skeletonized uh, remains. Then it went to the post-mortem examination. We were present at the post-mortem examination. Um, if there were complete and whole bodies of deceased victims, we weren't necessarily required. It was if there was any fragmentation or disruption or disarticulation of the limbs or, or parts of the body uh, and separate bone fragments that the pathologist might need assistance with um, to reconstruct or to look at reconstruction. Um, after the post-mortem examination, uh, the remains were returned to the refrigerated storage and we would conduct a preliminary anthropolo anthropology assessment. That could occur at the post-mortem examination or it might occur immediately after. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we knew from um, our involvement in this process that each URN vaguely, vaguely, nothing was meticulously examined at this point. We needed to know, did we have one person in this URN? And if we had more than one person, how many more persons might there be as a triage before um, the full anthropology assessments were undertaken? And that would give us an idea of, of how many people we were dealing with and therefore how long time that we would take. And then referring back to Grenfell Tower teams, had they finished that particular location and could we start um, on the people from, on the deceased victims from that flat. Uh, then we would go into the anthropology reporting stage. So this is, um, this was conducted in the temporary disaster victim identification mortuary next to uh, the mortuary at Westminster. And it was a very large space, so we had 12, 13 tables where we could lay out um, each victim from each flat and then lay out and examine every single URN that contained human remains in order to start to understand who we might have and how many people we had <coughs> and how much of the fragmented material would need to be laid out and physically reconstructed piece by piece. Now, if you look at the top right-hand corner of the diagram, you can see that there are three pink boxes, DNA, yes. fingerprints, and odontology. Why are those disciplines not joined with lines in the flow diagram? They were separate to our process, so they were... Um, they were th we weren't involved in anything with fingerprints. The, the, the material from the deceased victims that we examined was too badly damaged, so we had no fingerprints, but certainly for DNA and odontology, it was all the, always the question, how can we identify the people that you're examining um, on your tables? And this is odontology and DNA are primary identifying, ad identifying disciplines. So uh, DNA was possible in a number of cases, but again, this was um, very much dependent on whether there was tissue, soft tissue left, and whether the soft tissue uh, would yield a DNA profile that would, could be matched um, to the sample from the deceased victim or the deceased victim's family. And odontology are the forensic dentists who look at all the fragmented teeth because often teeth were not in uh, maxillas, upper jaws, or mandibles, lower jaws. So they would have to be reconstructed and then returned potentially to um, the upper or lower jaws from which they'd originally come. So those processes were being undertaken as we were doing our work. Um, and so they were in tandem, but not part of our process per se. Uh, uh, right. Are you able to tell us at what point during the flow diagram flow, DNA or odontology uh, played a part? It could be at any point in time. So it could be at the post-mortem examination with the forensic pathologists, 
or it could be during um, the anthropology assessment, or it could be once things are cleaned and, and laid out that there's the potential for DNA from a particular bone fragment once it's reunited back to a deceased victim. So it really was, you know, a, a rolling program of considering the other disciplines as in when we could um, get them in to, to examine right. the remains. And was it invariably the case that you used DNA and odontology as uh, methods for identification? They already? were the primary methods, I believe, yeah. Right. Yeah, and this was orchestrated under the aegis of um, post-mortem coordinators and the senior identification right. manager. And if you had a clear and reliable identification based on DNA or odontology or a combination of the two, mm. would you need to go any further in your anthropological assessment? Yes, because we, what, we, what, what our remit was was to, to reconstruct the bones, uh, because the, the DNA or the odontology will only identify the piece that's being... Analyzed. So what we need to do is return um, or repatriate that piece to the rest of the body to ensure that um, the identification is is that person, is, is the rest of the body. And so a lot of the, the skeletal fragments had to be reconstructed into limbs um, and, and, uh, and the rest of the body in order that that primary identification could be matched to that particular set of human remains. Can I ask you please to go to page 20, paragraph 4, fourth paragraph down on that page. Uh, and you say there, uh, given the catastrophic uh, nature uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, given the catastrophic nature and the subsequent effect that the fire caused to the bodies of the deceased victims, forensic anthropologists were asked to examine all cases where the remains of the deceased victims had been affected by thermal damage, which had caused skeletonization, extensive fragmentation, cremation, and commingling. Correct. Yes. Um, just the word, the word thermal damage, which had caused skeletonization. Could you explain what thermal damage is in that context? Thermal damage is the damage that, that is created uh, is caused to, to the human body in this in this instance um, by the fire so it, it the fire was at such temperatures um, that it was in some cases like a commercial crematorium um, in terms of temperature so so the, the the thermal damage that is caused to the human body at those temperatures means that once the, the soft tissue has been burnt away, the bones are then exposed. And as the bones are exposed, they necessarily fragment and, and start to become very calcined. So they, they go from shades of black in color right through to shades of blue, uh, blue, gray, and white. And once they get to the, the end of that process, the blue, gray, and the white, the calcination is, is such that um, it is similar to what would occur in a commercial crematorium. And so, therefore, at that point, you can't, um, at the moment, recover DNA from remains that are that severely burned mm -hmm. and thermally damaged. Mm -hmm. So, in this context, that's what thermal damage means. Uh, and if you uh, go, please, to page 50, in the context of the word commingling, which you use at the end of the paragraph I've just read, yes. I've just read together, the word commingle is identified and defined at the bottom of page 50 here. And it says, bone assemblage containing remains of multiple individuals often comprising incomplete or fragmentary bones. That's correct. That, that's what you mean by commingle that's in this right. context. Isn't that's it? right, yeah. Yes. Uh, Now, if we go back to page 20, you say in the penultimate paragraph, as I've just shown you, um, when the human remains of the deceased victims were recovered, how did you establish whether the remains of the deceased victims had been commingled? Um, it's repetition of skeletal elements. So, for example, if, if a URN was opened and you could see that there were uh, the, the, the heads of three femurs, it would give you um, an indication that there are a minimum of three people within that uh, unique reference number. 
Um, obviously, it doesn't preclude the fact that there might be other people inside, but that's your, at the moment, that's your minimum number of individuals. It might be the case once you lay out that skeletal material from that URN that you have three heads of the right femur, but you might also have a juvenile bone, which would, you know, so you've got three adults and, and one juvenile, and therefore your minimum number of individuals is four. It's not to say that you don't have more than that, but then, of course, you need to lay out and examine every single URN from that recovery space to ensure that you've, you've got um, the minimum number of individuals um, from that space. And at the foot of page 20, you go on to say, the devastation wrought to the interior of many of the flats and communal spaces where single individuals had died and those locations where multiple individuals had died together inevitably resulted in the commingling of the bodies of the deceased victims. Mm. This phenomenon has previously been described as disaster-induced commingling, where human remains may initially appear to have belonged to a single individual, but closer examination reveals that the remains of one or more individuals are embedded or commingled with another. Yes, correct. Uh, uh, it, it, how was the anthropological assessment carried out in cases where the deceased victims' bodies had commingled? Um, it depended on the preservation of the bodies. So in some cases, we had um, fragments or p potentially burnt torsos of an individual where um, the head and neck, uh, the upper and lower limbs might not be present. So we might have a number of, of burnt torsos that were separate individuals, but then the URNs, from that entire flat would then have to be laid out um, one table per URN to establish what material, what skeletal material we had inside and then to start reconstructing the bones from each URN in order that once you've reconstructed a bone to a length, to a, to a virtually complete or partially complete, complete bone to try and then look at um, whether we had bones that uh, anatomically or mechanically, physically fitted or anatomically fitted, mechanically fitted. Um, and then it's a process of elimination and, uh, and you know, taking one bone at a time across your, your range of torsos in attempt to reassociate those bones. And is that the way you ensure that the remains of a deceased victim were, were reconciled to the individual to whom they belonged? Yes, and, and, and so everything was reconstructed. And then the process of, of looking to see what, uh, what actually um, mechanically fitted or physically fitted in terms of fitting limbs back together and limbs back to joint space, joints, uh, was undertaken. Um, and this, was, this, this process could go on for three or four weeks, depending on the number of victims and depending on the level of fragmentation and disruption of the bodies. Yes. Uh, in the next paragraph, which starts, The Nature and Extent, you go on two-thirds of the way through that to say, when the commingling of human remains was identified, the remains of each deceased victim was examined individually mm -hmm. and then collectively with the other victims recovered from the flat to ensure that all of the human remains of each deceased victim were reconciled, where possible, to the individual to whom they belonged. Yes. In, 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 in all cases, did you receive a satisfactory confirmation that the remains of a deceased victim were reconciled to the individual to whom they belong? No, and, and so, you know, in cases where you're not sure um, and, and there's a descending hierarchy of, of surety that I've given in the report, um, it's made much more difficult and in, in some ways impossible if you've got individuals from a flat or recovery space who are not related to one another. Um, if you can't be sure where the limb or the fragment comes from, then it has to be retained for the identification commission and the coroner's decision on, on what to do. So it's those flats where multiple victims that were not related to one another were recovered that was far more problematic um, because obviously if, if the deceased victims are from the same family and it's known that there's, there's you know, no one else in that uh, recovery space, then, then conversations can be had via the family liaisons officers and the, the family to, to decide the material that I can't attribute 
to victim A, B, C or D. Uh, I can't attribute that to one particular person, but they're all your family members. So how would you like this to be um, returned? Would yeah. you like this to be returned to the matriarch of the family if the matriarch is the person, you know, the elder of the family who may have died or the patriarch? And, and that's how it was done. Yes, I see. And it, in those cases where you did not or could not receive a satisfactory confirmation that the remains of a deceased victim could be reconciled to the individual to whom they belonged, did, did that affect your conclusions about that individual? In what way? Did it introduce an element of doubt that you had properly identified them as an individual and as no. separate from others? No, it didn't. I mean, nothing was was repatriated to an individual that we weren't sure about, and certainly, we had um, we had a process called anthropology grand rounds that was instigated by uh, the coroner, Professor Fiona Wilcox, whereby. She and the senior investigation manager, who was also the deputy um, senior investigating officer, DCI Chalmers, Andrew Chalmers, and um, the post-mortem coordinators and the operational forensic managers, we would have um, a collective examination meeting within the mortuary, and each individual um, and their bones and the unattributed material that we could not return back to an individual were examined and the case was discussed. The, the recovery locations of uh, the individuals were projected onto a television, and any drawings or archaeological uh, recovery or context documentation that was integral to interpreting um, the original positions as found of the individuals was projected so that in each case, within each flat, um, the, the anthropology ground rounds identified uh, the surety or or the lack of surety for some of the smaller fragments for each particular victim or that came in in, in uh, URNs that we couldn't return back to any one person. But nonetheless, looking at the matter in the round, mm. uh, were you satisfied? Yes. Are you satisfied that the work you carried out to identify all the individual deceased yes. um, uh, who were examined by you and the team were, were identified? Yes, I am. You are. Can we look then at uh, lower down paragraph, uh, pe or page 21, um, two thirds of the way down your screen, and perhaps scroll down a bit further. And you say, now at the top of your screen, middle of page 21, the anthropology and odontology examinations of multiple deceased victims from a single recovery location initially presented several operational challenges. Mm -hmm. And then you've set them out all, uh, in that page and over the page, the first. Information was gathered by the police from phone calls made by individuals trapped in the building. This provided the authorities with an initial indication of where people were in the building and how they may have moved between floors and flats during the fire. However, in some locations, the remains of unknown individuals were found that did not fit the profile of people who were believed to be in that location at the time. Correct. And just, just pausing there, how did you overcome that challenge? I think because the, the individuals that... Uh, the individuals... This information was coming from the police. And so when we looked at a flat and, and laid out all the, the bodies of the, and the fragments of the deceased victims, we, we could say, uh, actually, we've got three more additional victims here than you're aware of from your last known telephone <coughs> call that you've, you've told us about. So at that point, um, we, would, we would be uh, either adding people to the number of individuals thought to be in that flat at the time, um, and and sometimes removing individuals, but but it, it I think it depended, and this would need to be asked of the police really, who made the phone call and where the information came from, which we weren't aware of. All we were told was, you know, we suspect uh, there are a number of individuals in here, and and we would come back and and give them the number once the examinations had taken place. Yes. Uh, 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 and secondly, you say, due, due to structural issues and health and safety concerns associated with working in Grenfell Tower, there could also be a considerable time delay between initial body recovery operations within an individual flat and final body recovery of the remains of all deceased victims within that flat. Yes. These delays were unavoidable 
However, it inevitably affected the time that it took for all of the anthropology examinations of human remains from the flat to be completed, and this in turn sometimes delayed the victim identification process. Yes. Now, apart from affecting the time that it took for all the anthropological examinations uh, from the flat and the victim identification process, did the structural problems and the health and safety problems uh, adversely affect the recovery operations in Grenfell Tower and the victim identification process in any other way? No, it, it, was, a, it was a time constraint, um, really. And, and unfortunately, the delay, uh, it's very difficult um, for families to have to wait as, as long as they do have to wait for positive identification of their loved ones. So we were very much aware that, you know, although the delays were unavoidable, um, you know, that there was no... The delay to the process was unavoidable, but that the way that the process was undertaken was exactly the same. It was rigorous and very assiduous, and, and everything was recovered. If we turn on to page 22, you can see a fifth challenge, which says this, DNA analysis could not be undertaken on many of the deceased victims that the forensic anthropology team were asked to examine, as the catastrophic nature of the fire had caused severe calcination and cremation of the bodies, thereby preventing DNA analysis. Therefore, detailed anthropological examinations of the often extensively commingled human remains of deceased victims needed to first take place in order to separate the remains of one victim from another before odontology examinations could be undertaken. Yes. Now, when you refer to the calcination and cremation of bodies, mm. is that what you were referring to before? That's right. It's essentially cremation as in a commercial crematorium. That's right. And so, so at those temperatures... Um, the, the bones will fragment and then they'll change colour the, the, as it gets hotter and hotter and the bones become more calcined. The, there's no DNA left to, in order to amplify for a profile. And therefore, um, therefore that's... And, and you also get severe shrinkage, often get severe shrinkage in, um, of the bones. So, so that, that was a, the challenge of... of um, of the nature of this particular incident and, and why the guidelines had to be adapted, particularly to this um, this particular uh, problem with with the uh, thermal damage. And once you get to that stage, calcination and effectively cremation, is yeah. there anything that the material will tell you about the identification of the? person. Yeah, so it, so it, it, you, you can still reconstruct these remains, which, which is the point. So, um, you know, skulls can be reconstructed and, and bones can be reconstructed. So it does, as long as the uh, reconstruction process takes place and you have the time um, and the rigour and the experienced people to do it, um, you are actually reconstructing. Um, the victims, and so, uh, yeah. It, it's more challenging and it takes more time, but ultimately it can still be done and right. was done. Now, in cases where, and you tell us this lower down the same page, but I can summarise it, I think, in cases where the remains of a deceased victim couldn't be identified by either on odontology or DNA or fingerprints, you say that those deceased victims were identified by secondary indicators. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean there by secondary indicators? Well, the Interpol DVI guidelines identify primary and secondary um, identifiers of which odontology, DNA and fingerprints are the primary. So secondary, and certainly anthropology is regarded as a... Um, um, a secondary identifier. So if, for example, we had uh, a number of victims, uh, we had a female victim and children of different ages, then the biological profile in, in this case would be um, very particular to aging the children, providing an age range for the children and the mother, and any individual skeletal characteristics are, has that individual um, sustained anti-mortem injuries during life and a number of occasions this was correct um, you know d does that indicate one person over another if there's more than one female in in the, the space so it's really using the information provided by um, us during our examination of the the age range the sex the ancestry the individual characteristics of that pro of that particular individual 
um, looking at fractures or hip replacements or any kind of um, additional surgical um, implements that might be present or, or indeed odontology um, that might be present um, in terms of bridges and, and think dentures, things like that. And, um, and building a profile of each person, but then each person within that flat. Um, and then comparing that this wasn't our job, but of course then the reconciliation team uh, from the Metropolitan Police would be looking at the information they had that we didn't have in terms of who they believed to be in that particular space at the time. And if you scroll down on page 22, a little bit lower down, I, I just want to show you the paragraph there and now in the middle of your screen, which starts the desired end result. Uh, and you explain what that is. And then... It, um, you say, in a small number of cases, the remains of deceased victims were identified via secondary indicators, biological profile, individuating skeletal characteristics, archaeological context, mm. and recovery location. Just mm. pausing there, what, what do you mean there by archaeological context? Um, how one person was uh, related to another. So it, the recovery location is obviously the flat or the communal space, and the... Um, archaeological context was um, literally where was that person in the flat and where was that person in relation to other persons. So it's known that um, a number of individuals, you might have a flat that had three or four or five people who may have been related to each other. So you may have had an ind individuals who, uh, like a mother and daughter or a mother and a son, and then... Um, other individuals who are from a different family but were also related. So again, you're looking at, um, is it likely, and, and it's not a likelihood ratio per se, but is it likely that the two females in this location within this flat are related and separate to the three other people in the flat who are also related, but they're not related families to one another? Does that make sense? Yes, I think, yes thank you. Uh, and you go on to say as there were no dental records or, or remains or records or the remains were too degraded to yield a DNA profile. Mm. In these instances, a more detailed social and osteobiological profile of the victim was required to match the skeletal characteristics recorded mm. in the remains of the victim. Mm. Um, what, is a, what do you mean by a, a more detailed social well, and osteobiological profile? This was, this was sending um, the family liaison officers back to the families to say... Uh, let's talk about any dental work or any medical treatments or, you know, d does your son or daughter or, or family member have anything that could help us um, in terms of uh, anti-mortem collection? So it was sending um, the flows back, the family liaison officers, back to the families to say, you know, we've found, we've found a spine that's very degraded here. It looks like it's suffered a lot of trauma is you know is there anything about that you can you tell us anything about your family member would what what did they do in life um how active were they what kind of physical characteristics did they have that might be impacting on the skeleton of the person so that's what that means I see. and that that assists does it in identification it 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 helps this it helps assist build up the profile of the person that we have in front of us on the examination table and certainly you know, it's it, you have to be very careful be, because you don't want to be cognitively biased by that information. But indeed, you also want to know by sending the family liaison officers back to families. We often got uh, more families involved in the discussion, and then someone might come and say, "Oh, yeah, well, you know, there was an injury, or there was something else, or do you remember the time that that person broke their toe?" So that it was really asking the right questions once we knew what we had. Can we then go to page 23? And you set out there the standard operating procedures put in place for the forensic anthropological examinations. Uh, and uh, if we look down at the next heading down, preliminary anthropo anthropology assessment, mm -hmm. um, you've set out a list uh, of, of matters there. And you say, if a preliminary anthropology assessment was required, this took place during the post-mortem examination in which one URN, URN was examined at a time and generally encompassed the following procedures. Yeah. And then there is a list there. And if you go down, it, it runs from one to six. Um, and if people just, or you can just look at that to yourself and then go over to the next page, page 24, 
paragraph 6 there. And then you say, following the preliminary anthropology assessment, the remains were returned to a refrigerated storage facility and were subsequently examined by the forensic anthropology team on a flat-by-flat or a communal space basis, whereupon a complete anthropology assessment of the human remains from the recovery location was conducted. Yes. What, what would warrant a preliminary anthropology assessment? Because it was being conducted at the post-mortem examination, um, it was providing assurance uh, to the forensic pathologist that there was only one person, um, the skeletal remains of one person that we could see in that URN. It's not to say that um, there wasn't an additional person, but we could certainly flag up that, look, you have commingled remains in these URNs, so uh, you know the post-mortem examination that you're conducting on, on perhaps you know a torso or a partial torso or partial body uh, is not necessarily related to the skeletal remains you have in these separate URNs. Yes, and who would make the decision to conduct a preliminary anthropology assessment? This was under the aegis of the forensic anth- uh, pathologists. They, they would request our presence, um, and it was, it was done at their request. And, and what directly. framework would be used to make that decision? Do you know? I don't. You would, yes. ha- you would have to ask them. Can we look at page 25, <coughs> where you deal with the forensic anthropology unique reference number, or URN, there? Yes. Uh, and uh, you say the anthropological examination of human remains within each URN uh, recovered from the Grenfell fr- from the Grenfell Tower, sorry, from Grenfell Tower was classified as either a primary or secondary URN. Mm. Um, could you just explain the difference between a primary and a secondary URN? So, th- so the primary URN contained the remains of one distinct individual that we could see, um, and it was a complete or partially complete individual. Uh, fleshed remains or burnt flesh remains or sometimes a, um, a highly fragmented skeleton that if you, you took a look at it, there were no repeated elements, skeletal elements that would suggest that there was an additional uh, person. That might be your preliminary investigation and assessment. But of course, until you open the secondary URN, which are all the other uh, URNs that come in from that flat, so you can imagine the conditions within some of the recovery flats uh, was so c- catastrophic that what the forensic archaeologists and DVI teams were doing was recovering what they could see as an, an individual. But it might be the case that um, the bone fragments, particularly if the individuals are close together, are commingled with one another. So. Um, we, we provided this classification so that we could we knew that if you had five primary URNs from a flat location, you had a minimum of five people. That is not to say when you open the secondary URNs, which might be a single bone, or it might be a small assemblage of bones, or a single body part like an arm or a hand, or it could be multiple fragmented bones. Um, so that was our way of of giving uh, a preliminary assessment saying, okay, I think we have a minimum of five people here, but we haven't examined everything yet. That's that's an advisory number at the moment during the examination. And then that information gets fed back to the reconciliation teams and the teams uh, collating all the intelligence around that flat. And as we work through the secondary URNs and all the single elements and the body parts and the fragmented remains, that number might go up and down. Uh, uh, Would you use a secondary URN in a case where remains were commingled? Yes. You would. Now, when when you say no fleshed human remains, I mean, is that that what it sounds like? No flesh on on the... Yes, so so the thermal damage to... um, the majority of human remains that we examined uh, were very often times a torso that may or may not have upper and lower limbs attached. Um, it may not have a vertebral column connected to a head. So um, in, in those cases, you can, you can lay these remains out and say, well, we do have the remains of five <coughs> 
complete or partially complete or very disrupted, but still identifiable as a single person in this primary URN. Right. And in the last sentence in the middle paragraph there, you, you say, for example, where there were no flesh or human remains or where there was no distinct highly fragmented skeleton assessed to be present within the URN. Yeah. Um, when, when you say no distinct highly fragmented skeleton, what about a distinct but not highly fragmented skeleton? Or is, or is there no such thing? Well, there's no such thing, really, because it would, if there was a, a distinct skeleton within that URN, it would not be a secondary URN, it yes, would I be see. a primary URN. I see. Now, you go on to say, at the foot of the page and over the next page, the use of the secondary URN system and the number of URNs designated under this classification that may have been recovered from an individual flat or communal space was also necessarily influenced by the level of destruction to the internal structure and or contents present within a flat or communal space. Mm. For example, in a number of cases, extensive destruction of the structure and contents within an individual flat or communal space often further contributed to the disarticulation, extensive fragmentation, commingling and dispersal of the bodies of deceased victims, with the result that human remains may not be specifically attributed to any one victim at the point of recovery. Are you able to explain precisely how the secondary URN system allowed that challenge to be overcome? Well, the secondary URN system was, was certainly instigated with... Uh, with information from the forensic archaeologists and TVI teams. So when they've recovered the main body part, if I can use that term, of an individual, that becomes the primary URN we're dealing with. But they, the, the bodies might be so close, closely uh, located together that the secondary URNs cannot be attributed to any one person. And so the documentation and paperwork that would come in and the photographs from the archaeology and DVI teams would reflect that um, issue, really. And, and so uh, every secondary URN was regarded, uh, was, not, was not attributed to any primary URN without um, examination and reconstruction. Yeah, so further work would have to be done. Much further work. Yes, I see. I'd like to look next with you, please, at page 26 and the forensic anthropology examination that you carried out mm -hmm. and you deal with here. Uh, you say the forensic anthropology examination generally encompassed the following procedures. Note that if a forensic anthropology reassessment occurred, this, ass this examination also generally followed the same examination procedures. Mm -hmm. And then um, you set out at the bottom of 26 and over through 27, if we can just look at that, a long list of matters. We turn to page 27. Uh, um, and then over, um, please, down, continuing to page 28. And then over to 29, which is where it ends, and, and you start with thermal damage. Um, Looking at the entire list on those pages that I've put up on the screen, we can perhaps go back a page to the last of the lists. Um, does that accurately describe the, the stages in the process for forensic anthropology examination? It does, yes. You conducted. Yes. And that is for each individual, is it? Yes. Yes. And... How does the reconstruction of each individual skeletal element inform the anthropological process more broadly? In other words, what, do you, what information do you get out of it? Well, well you, have, you have a reconstructed skeleton in most cases that you can then conduct a biological profile on, so you have the entirety of, of, of what you've reconstructed, and then you can look at an age range, sex, ancestry, um, you can understand the association potentially between uh, single dental elements and, and the mandibles and maxillas you might have in the reconstruction. So it, it then provides the basis from which the profile can then be constructed. Yes, I see. And looking at that a little bit more closely, can we go please to page 33? On page 33, you uh, deal with biological profile. Yeah. Uh, and you summarise the techniques, the anthropological techniques and standards used to construct the biological profile for the remains of the deceased victims yes. uh, recovered from Grenfell Tower. Mm 
uh, and uh, you, uh, you say uh, in the middle of the next paragraph, for example, most standards used for the estimation of age and sex have been established using modern European and American skeletal series. These standards have not been shown to apply equally to human populations in other parts of the world. It has also been established that not only is there variation within single populations in the rate of skeletal maturation for age at death estimation, but there is also significant variation between populations. Mm -hmm. Please note that wherever possible, multiple methods of age estimation were utilised in order to provide an age at death or age range category for the human remains. Mm -hmm. um, what method, it, very briefly if you can, it may not be possible to do it briefly, but do your best. What methods did you use to estimate age at death in this case? Well, obviously age at, at death is, what we're looking at is skeletal maturation. So... Um, an adult human skeleton, the, the human skeleton of an adult, will be generally uh, have completed fusion and completed its final shape by the age of um, 30 years of age. It can start earlier in some individuals. So what we're looking at is, do we have a juvenile? Um, do we have an infant? What is the rate of, of you know, what is the development state status of the bone that you have in front of you um, and how best can you identify an age range for this person and again we go back to reconstruction laying out the skeleton in anatomical position and um, looking at the states of fusion of the bones particularly in juveniles um, that will give you and separate one child from another for example or separate an individual who might be you know recently fused a young a young adult, young to medium age adult, from an older person where you've got degenerative changes on the skeleton that would indicate an older person. So the age of death is looking at um, various parts of the, the human body um, in terms of development and, and, and comparing them to population standards, which, as I've, I've pointed out, um, and mostly European and American. There are some skeletal series that are being developed for other populations, but you know, this is this is easier to apply if you know who your individual is. If you don't know who your individual is, you have to um, you have to be very cautious about how you apply the age at death, which is why the categories we've provided were very broad. Yes. And, and in, in relation to the categories, I think we could pick those up on page 34, where you identify those categories, juvenile, uh, adolescent, young adult, yeah. adult, and then over the page uh, to 35, over adult. And in each case, you've identified the main um, identifying factors and principles. Yes. 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 When it came then to identification according to sex of the deceased victims, I think you cover that on page... 35 on the, in, the, in the way you have on the screen in front of you. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and um, that, as you say, relies on the differences of sexual dimorphism uh, and some cranial morphology as well. Yes? That's right. Primarily uh, of the, the pelvic girdle. Yes. Uh, uh, but more difficult when re reliably estimating sex in juvenile remains. Yes. Yes, and yes. for the reasons you've given. Yes. And if we go to page 36, you say there under the heading Skeletal Variation and Individuating Features. Individuating features are features or variations that can be seen within the human skeleton that differ from one person to another. These features can include the identification of pathological processes, anti-mortem trauma, and the presence of non-metric traits. Mm -hmm. I'm just pausing there. What, what is a non-metric trait? A non-metric trait means it's, it's a trait that you... Uh, a morphology you see in the human skeleton that I might have that you may not have. So in some populations, um, you non-metric traits might be the difference in the angle of a particular bone, or it might be an additional foramina or a hole in a skeletal um, structure. It might be the bridging of a hole um, with a piece of bone. So they're, they're non-metric traits that are, these thing, traits are recorded, um, particularly if they're fragmented and you and you put things back together and you you might may see that reflection um, from one bone on one side of the body 
to one bone on the other where you have the same non-metric trait present. But sometimes they are unilateral and not bilateral. Right. And, and where, I mean, perhaps you can illustrate it by a case of um, acute arthritis. You might have it in one shoulder but not the other. Would that be a non-metric trait or would that be a pathological process? No, that's process? a pathological process. Right. But then you wouldn't just have... Uh, likely wouldn't just have problems in that shoulder girdle, you'd probably have problems with your back or other joint surfaces. Right. Uh, uh, and then um, you, 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 you've explained the references there. Uh, and if you go to page 37, you have a heading, Attribution of Human Remains. And you say there, attribution of, of remains to an individual was based on six categories, and these were generally made in reference to a main body part and are identified dental or skeletal remains. Yes. These categories are outlined below in a descending order of confidence of attribution. And there you have the, the categories, mm -hmm. physical and or me mechanical fit, most likely associated, consistent with exclusion, un unattributed and dissociated. Yes. Uh, and, and are you able to give us a distinction in, in between each of these categories in levels of certainty that you would use to establish each one? Well, certainly, if, if we can go back to the previous page, um, certainly the, the highest level of certainty is a physical or mechanical fit. So that's when you're actually fitting one bone fragment back to another, and they fit, um, they fit perfectly. Um, Mechanical fit, we're looking at joint surfaces. So, you know, is the bottom of my humerus that the larger arm, a bone of the arm, um, is it congruent with fitting with the, um, the bones of the lower arm that you might have? So physical and mechanical fit, um, even whilst you have thermal damage and you, you have shrinkage, is, is, is a, a, a reasonably confident way of, um, of reassociating remains. As you go down this um, number, you know, one to six, two to six, you're looking at most likely associated, you're looking at um, does the biological profile of this particular skeletal or elemental body part match the rest of the body that you have in front of you? Or does the cal color or degree of calcination of the bones, so is it all fairly uniform or is it not uniform? Now that can be a bit tricky because you might have uh, a, an item overlying the body, like a piece of furniture or, or a structural element that might um, shield the body from changes in colour occurring, but you're, lo and look, you're looking at the visual pair, so you're looking at size. Does this bone match the, the morphology, the shape and function that you can see from one side to another? Um, and... and yeah, and, and so you're, you're laying out everything and considering every bone in relation to the identified uh, bone or body part that you have in front of you. Consistent with, uh, we're going down the, the, the scale now, is, well, it's an adult bone or it's a juvenile bone or it's a male or a female, but if you've got multiple um, age groups and multiple sexes within that um, cohort of individuals from that flat, then again, that's all you can say. It's consistent with a male or a female. And if you have multiple males or females, that doesn't help you, but at least it gives you uh, an idea of if it's male, then it's certainly not related to your female victims. Yeah. So you're finding look, that process. And looking down these, these number of different categories, uh, are you applying judgment? A professional judgment when you distinguish yes. the categories. Yes, professional judgment, and and everything was discussed with the other lead anthropologists. So it wasn't uh, conducting each case on your own. It was certainly um, collaboration and frequent discussion to to get other people's opinions on on the level of certainty you had applied to those particular elements at the time. And then on page 38, your last category, six, is dissociated. And dissociated, you say, refers to remains that are not associated with the individual. However, as these skeletal elements have been recovered with the remains, following anthropological examination, they're separated from the remains and stay within the same URN, but are designated with the letter D, for example, dissociated from, bo from PM, dissociated bone from PM44, four zeros becomes PM4440 D to await coronial review during the anthropology grand rounds process. 
The dissociated material within a URN is reviewed during anthropology grand rounds to determine whether the material can ultimately be released or conversely must be retained by the coroner. And we'll come back to grand rounds shortly. But um, uh, you go on, I think, to say, uh, on the top of the next page, under the heading Dissociation of Human Remains, an individual case will be inventoried and laid out in anatomical position wherever possible. Mm. Any remains that are not considered to belong to that individual are recorded as additional bones under that URN number before reassociation takes place. Yes. Additional bones are recorded when we've got four cases. One, there's a clear recognition of a repeated skeletal element, for example, two proximal right tibiae. Two, the size and shape of a skeletal, or skeletal element is considered to be morphologically different. Three, there's a difference in the assessment of biological profile, such as the presence of adult human remains commingled with a juvenile skeletal element or age stroke sex differences. And four, recovery position of the remains after review of the scene photographs. Now, when you've established that a bone is not associated with a particular individual, do you then go on to see whether those remains can be associated with a different individual? Yes. You do. And is that the process you describe as, as reassociation? Correct. I see. Well, can you explain how that's undertaken? It, it is literally picking up that element and, and going to each uh, particular body with your DVI officer who doesn't let you out of their sight to, to see if that bone can be matched to something else that someone has reconstructed right. or that has a morphological or a structural um, appearance about it that might suggest it comes from someone else. So being taken from, let's say, a gracile female, adult female, to a robust adult male, if that's what the bone fragment that you have in your hand is suggesting. You used the word gracile there. I've seen uh, that in the report. What does that gracile mean? Gracile is, is just... Uh, uh, I guess fine boned would be another right. another description. Uh, and uh, if you look, please, at page thirty nine under the heading reassociation of, of remains, and then scroll down to the foot of that page, and then to the top of the next page, that's the process. That, that, those are the principles, is it? That's right. Are they? Which, Absolutely. You're you... going through these principles at every point to see whether you can reassociate this bone fragment or the body part to another individual. And once, is it right that once all the examinations and reassociations have been completed for a flat or a communal space, a, to a total minimum number of individuals, or MNI, is estimated? Correct. Uh, and how is the MNI calculated? It's calculated on, on the number of the same element, uh, elements that you have. So in, in this case, I've given the example of four right adult femora, which are, is thigh bone, um, produces an MNI count of four individuals, but then if you have a juvenile bone, uh, it cannot come from an adult, so therefore you have a minimum number of five. Yeah, and what is the purpose of the MNI as a concept? The purpose of the NMI, uh, MNI is, is to, to make sure that, it, that every fragment is checked and that you don't have an additional individual. Mm. So in this case, you know, your MNI counts might be on several different types of bones. So you might have let's say, five different types of bones that all give you different numbers, but the highest number, in this case the MNI count of four individuals, is what you're basing um, your MNI count on. But at any point in time, if you find another bone fragment that doesn't fit or is in addition to <coughs> your four individuals, then you have five. So, yeah. so this is, yeah. And, and so these MNI counts are, are photographed and recorded so that at any one time, um, if the coroner or the authorities wanted to know how the MNI for that flat was established, there's documentation photographic and written to demonstrate how that was achieved. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Chairman, I know that it's gone one o'clock. I've got yes. about ten minutes more questions for the, for the uh, witness. Um, I think it's, I'm in your hands. It's probably best to break now and come back and have the 10 minutes plus the break, if that's convenient to... Well, let's, take, let's take some soundings. I suspect, Ms. McKinnon, you were told to expect to be finished by lunchtime, weren't you? Yes, yes, but that's... Uh, <clears throat> well, how, first question, how um, difficult is it for you to stay on over lunch and, let's say, until half past two? That's fine. All right. That's helpful. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask the stenographer... Um, 
whether half an hour now would be more than she can really cope with. Right. So the the options then are, I mean, how long do you think you've actually got for questions, Mr. Uh, no more than 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes? Well, about 10 minutes. <laughs> right. Um, I think we, the options then are to break now for the usual hour or to expect to finish your evidence by half past one, which I sense you would prefer. Is that right? I have no preference. I can do either way. It's fine. Right. Carry on. Carry on. Yeah. We think it would be sensible to try and finish the evidence now, but that's, you are not to feel rushed in that. Uh, right. If it takes more than 10 minutes, we shan't hold it against you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank now, you. Can I ask you, please, to go to page 17, <clears throat> par fifth paragraph down there. Uh, you uh, <clears throat> explain in that paragraph as follows. On completion of the forensic anthropology and odontology examinations for each deceased victim recovered from a specific flat or communal space... The human remains and the recovery and mortuary examination and documentation case files were reviewed in a process called Anthropology Grand Rounds. This process was led by Her Majesty's Senior Coroner, Professor Fiona Wilcox, Deputy Senior Investigating Officer and Senior, Senior Inve Identification Manager, Detective Chief Inspector Andrew Chalmers, Metropolitan Police Service, Post-Mortem Coordinator, the uh, Operational Forensic Manager, OFM, Andrew Langley, Metropolitan Police Service, and the lead anthropologists and odontologists. Right. Now, first, can you explain what the purpose of the Grand Rounds was? It was, uh, it was, a, um, it was instigated by uh, Professor Wilcox, um, and it was a way of talking through the logistics and the recovery space and the examinations that had been undertaken within the temporary mortuary. And it gave everyone the opportunity to see the human remains laid out as they were complete, completed and repatriated, the bones repatriated to those individuals with whom we could do that. And uh, to really assess the recovery location to look at the photographs we had very large televisions where all the imagery from the archaeologists and the DVI officers could be could be reviewed so and was there a was this a process that you'd encountered before the Grenfell Tower yes uh, at the World Trade Center right and was there a grand round or an anthropological grand round held in relation to each deceased yes uh, and what did I think you've explained actually what the the grand round process involved um, who designed the anthropology grand rounds. Well, it, it was Professor Wilcox who came, who, who requested that we do this, and it very quickly became a vital part of the um, of the process, which ultimately informed the identification commission, which which occurred after grand rounds. Yes, I see. And were there reports made from the grand rounds, which then fed into the DVI committee? Yes. Yeah, so we produced interim um, reports on each individual following the grand rounds. And, uh, or during the ground rounds, and they were used as uh, preliminary paperwork uh, in order to inform the subsequent identification commission. Yes, thank you. And in cases where uh, there were more than one deceased recovered from a single location, that was reviewed, I think, during the ground rounds process? It was, yes. And then if you go to the top of page 18, you say... Uh, this review included confirmation of the minimum number of victims from the flat or communal space the context and recovery position of each of the victims, the nature and extent of the commingling of human remains identified at that particular location, together with any additional information that may be deemed to be pertinent to the particular flat or communal space under review. And what sorts of information would you consider pertinent to the particular flat or communal space under review? It, it might be the number of times the DVI and forensic archaeology teams had to go back into that flat. A number of the flats were in far worse structural condition than others. So it might be that um, a number of weeks or sometimes months had passed between an initial examination and the final clearance um, of the flat. And, and whether, you know, some flats were <coughs> more catastrophically uh, destructed in a way than, than other flats. So it really did depend on... Um, and that informed the, the level of fragmentation sometimes. You know, if you had a flat that was had really been destroyed by the fire, 
um, that would obviously have a, an effect on the fragmentation of the remains. And so the coroner and the attending um, officers needed to know that about that particular flat. I see. And based on the process that you adopted, how confident can you be that you appropriately or properly identified the relevant information in relation to each deceased? Very confident. And you go on to say in the next paragraph, that the information reviewed during the Anthropology Grand Rounds process was subsequently used to inform the deliberations of the Identification Commission, which was conducted under the direction of Her Majesty's Senior Coroner, Professor Fiona Wilcox. Uh, is it right to say that you yourself did not have any direct input into the formal identification of the deceased? No, the, the results of the team, the Anthropology team, were, were um, submitted to the Identification Commission, but no, we weren't part of that, um, that process in terms of sitting on the commission. And who appointed that commission? I don't know, I'm afraid. And do you have any information or knowledge about how it operated? No, I didn't attend and, didn't. and I don't know, no. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, well, um, I think I've done better than the 10 minutes that I gave the chairman. <laughs> uh, but um, Ms McKenna, I've come to the end of my questions for you that I've prepared, but there may be other questions, so I'm going to ask the chairman to take the usual break, if I may. Yes, well, as you may know, we have to have a break at this stage so that uh, Mr Millett can check he's not left anything out, and to enable others who are following the proceedings to suggest further questions. So we'll stop there. We'll resume at 20 past. Will that be enough, long enough? Yes. We'll come back at 20 past one, and then we'll see if there are any more questions for you then. Thank you. All right, thank you. Would you like to go to the usher, please? Thank you, Mr. Willett. 24th one, then, please. Thank you. Okay.
Yeah, would you ask Miss McKinnon to come back in, please? Right, Ms. McKinnon, we'll see if there are any more questions for you. Yes, yes Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, can the witness please be shown paragraph, or oh, page 40? And on page 40, you refer to the MNI. Yes. Uh, the minimum number of individuals, and you've explained the concept. And under the heading, <coughs> uh, you uh, say in the third line, <coughs> excuse me, However, given the nature of this particular disaster, in that the deceased victims from Grenfell Tower were recovered from specific locations within flat, straight communal spaces, and each location was comprehensively excavated and examined, the MNI for each flat, straight communal space could be confidently ascribed. Yes. Can you explain why you were confident that you had correctly identified the actual number of individuals at Grenfell Tower? Um, because each, each fragment of bone and each body part of each deceased victim was examined. And in this case, in Grenfell Tower, we had forensic archaeologists and DVI officers recovering um, and removing the structural debris and the bodies of the deceased victims down to the concrete floor. So unlike something like the World Trade Center, where the remains of victims from that incident were blown over Lower Manhattan, um, uh, the recovery spaces were very uh, particular and confined within each flat. I see. Uh, and this may be a question for the archaeologists, but help me if you can. Yes. H how confident are you that there was nobody left in the tower unidentified? Very confident. And that's based on? That's based on the bodies that I examined and the rigour um, with which the recoveries and the clearance of the f of the flats following each recovery um, were, were undertaken. Right. And was that a specific question addressed in the anthropology grand rounds or the grand rounds more generally? I'm sorry. What do you mean? Well, during the grand rounds, did, yes. Did, did that question come up? Yes. It did. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no further questions for you, uh, Ms. McKinnon. Thank McKinnon, you. So it remains for me only to thank you very much for your report. Uh, for the inquiry and for coming here today and assisting us with your evidence. We're extremely grateful to you. Thank so you very thank much. Thank you very much. And before you go, no, let me say thank you as well, please, on behalf of the panel. I think we've all found your evidence extremely interesting. Ah, okay. And I, uh, speaking for myself, I can say that I wasn't really fully aware of the significant part played by the anthropologists in the extremely difficult and delicate task of identifying the deceased. So your evidence has been very interesting and very helpful, and we're very grateful to you for Thank coming. You. And I'm sorry we kept you beyond the usual hour. But Absolutely fine. And you're Thank now you. free to go, of course. Thank, Thank you very, very much. And I'd like to thank the others who, who've been um, supporting our proceedings and whom we've kept sitting later than usual. Um, I'm very grateful that we could finish that witness's evidence before we break for lunch and indeed, I think, for the day. Is that right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Can I say thank you very much both to the witness who's gone, I think, but to you as well and the panel for sitting a little bit later into the lunch uh, to accommodate the witness and, of course, the transcriber and document manager yes. as well. Thank you. And um, that's all we shall be doing today. Yes, we have but one we... more factual witness next Monday. Yes. Uh, Dr. Carl Harrison, who is the uh, archaeologist, he will come and give evidence. Yes. Scheduled next Monday. But from tomorrow onwards, uh, we have the family's presentations. And we shall start those at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, please.